Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Good afternoon. I hope you all had a, a good lunch. I didn't quite get mine uh, yet, so my tummy's still grumbling, but hopefully I'll get around to it soon. Um, welcome to those who have just joined us um, for the first time today. We were on earlier, but you might be coming in for the first time. Let me know if you can see me, hear me okay, and everything's working. It's great to see everybody using the chat so much today. It's fantastic. Uh, we uh, are in the second session. Um, you will be able to watch a replay in the same location for both the morning and the afternoon if you've missed anything. Uh, so just a quick recap of what's going on. This is the Digital Transformation in HR and L&D conference. Uh, we have, uh, I'll be bringing on my speakers shortly, uh, but we have the chat there on the right, all clear, all good, great stuff. If you are having problems, refreshing the browser for this system works well. It, um, it'll bring you straight back in. So give that a shot. Um, there's also a question section, which today has been absolutely huge and very hard to stay on top of. So if you've got any questions, uh, you can pop them in there. We'll do our best to get to them. Uh, the sessions are only sort of 45 minutes each. So we do get through them pretty quickly. Loud and clear, great stuff. So what I'll do now is I will just go and get my next uh, speakers ready. Um, we'll be ready to go in another few minutes. So uh, stick around. See you soon. All right, let me just get my speakers up. I have uh, Dr. Michael Hallisey joining us now. I'll get you up first, Michael. There you are. So just, um, Michael, share your camera and microphone once the prompt comes up on your screen. And I will invite the other members in as well. I know we have Laurie there. Laurie, I'll do the same for you. Michael, how are you doing? Good, Chris. How are you? Hi, good. You're loud and clear. Just let me get um, all of our speakers up and we'll go from there. So, uh, what's we got here? Kevin as well. Kevin, I will bring you onto the screen. Might take a few seconds. And uh, Michelle and Dara. Dara, there you are. I'll bring you on as well. Hello, Laurie. How are you doing? Hello. I'm good. I'm fine. Well, I can see you and hear you perfectly. Okay, good. Waiting now on a couple of others too long channel as well Michelle good afternoon all hello hi Dara hello Kevin how are hello, you doing everybody how are you hey Mike and Dara as well uh, Michelle I've got you there hi Kevin hi Laurie hello how's and... everybody today yeah, good. Good. <laughs> oh, it's very, very spring-like today, isn't it? I don't know where you're coming from, but Absolutely. it's spring in Dublin. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good in Dublin, I have to say. Clear so I just double-check there that um, any of my current speakers up there, that you don't have another browser open at the moment, that you've only got this one session playing. Yep. Yep. Double-check. No problem possible because I had 
I can see you there, Michelle. Michelle, I might just have to work with her to get her connected in a moment. Uh, Michelle, if you hear me, just uh, hold on there for a moment. I'll get the session up and running and then I'll help Michelle to actually get connected. Um, it's just somebody asking about the replays. Yep, the replays will be in the same location. Just come back once they are ready. Um, I know that room one's already ready. So usually they load when we're finished. Um, so I will get this now up and running. I'll take that down so we can all see each other beautifully. Uh, so this uh, session I have um, Dr. Michael Hallisey um, moderating the session. So thanks for joining me, Michael, and, and I really appreciate you putting your hand up to, to moderate the session. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Hallisey is experienced in integrating ICT into a range of educational settings. He has an extensive experience of supporting teachers and educational organisations on issues associated with the challenge of ICT integration. He is the founding partner of H2 Learning. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. I will pass over to you now and you can take uh, a lead of the, of the session. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I had the opportunity to tune in this morning for some of the sessions and uh, was really, really interesting. So uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock and my job is to moderate. So um, I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin, Laurie, um, Michelle, who will be with us in a few minutes and Dara. So I suppose just to get us started, uh, the title of our session is The Future of Learning. Um, E-learning classroom or blended. Uh, welcome, Michelle. Um, Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm late joining you. Yeah, there's always somebody Hello, late, sure. Michelle. You know, uh... <laughs> Te technical issues, but I'm here now. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what they say. That's the new issue. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that or you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but listen, you're it's great, and I'm looking forward to learning so much from you all. I've just been reading your your uh, bios and. Rather than I introducing each of you, I will let you do that yourselves. And Kevin, I'm going to start with you. And I suppose going back to our title there, uh, blended learning at the moment in my world anyway is a buzzword. And even yesterday I was talking to a colleague who's involved in the whole area of virtual environments and virtual learning. And we had a half an hour discussion on blended learning. So I suppose to kick us off and I'll go around to each one individually, uh, maybe introduce yourself and tell us what does blended learning mean to you? So good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon to everybody who's, who's joining us. Um, my name is Kevin Hannigan. I'm a client director with a company called HPC, uh, and we specialize in behavioral change and leadership development, uh, working with a range of companies across Ireland, the UK, Northern Europe, and, and into the US as well. In terms of what does blended learning look like? I think there's two important considerations for us. The first is, um, whether or not post-COVID uh, we actually look at a, a, a blend of delivery. So, and for most people that really looks at, you know, face-to-face -face versus vir virtual. But in some ways, I think that's probably too simplistic a dichotomy. I think the real challenge for us is to consider learning as a, as a blend of modalities. So some of that is going to be participant led. Some of that's going to be led by facilitators. Some of that's going to be coaching. Some of that's going to involve uh, workplace experiences and feedback. So I think that's probably when we think about blended learning, I think we've got to shift beyond the current environment that we find ourselves in, uh, which is w one which is enforced. And in some ways, it's a very narrow vision of blended learning in the same way that working from home is a very narrow concept to us right now because of the pandemic. But I think Brilliant. That's where we're yeah. inevitably shifting to is, is a blend of modalities. Yeah, I know. I like it. And Laurie, what does it mean to you? Uh, so I'm, I've am i been doing a lot of uh, learning in different um, ways for many years. And um, blended learning to me right now means a combination. I think Kevin described it quite uh, brilliantly, you know, a blend of modalities, yes. whether it's partly in person, online, social learning, which I'll talk about later. Yes. And you, I, you never said anything about your company. So you better yes, to... right. I was quick to answer the question. My name is Laurie Shook. I am a director of Shook Svensson, and we deliver uh, team development, leadership development, coach training. Yeah. Super. And Michelle, tell us what what is blend for you, and would you agree what what Kevin uh, and Laurie have said? 
We yeah, I think uh, good afternoon, um, everybody and, and everyone that's joined joined the conference. Um, I I think um, it's been described perfectly already, and I think the clue is in the title. Blended means means exactly that. Um, so it's it's a, a a mix of different approaches that that best suit the learner. And I think it's important to remember um, how how we deliver training in whatever form. It's actually the learner at the end of the day that needs to benefit from from what we're delivering. Um, my role is I, I work at the National Skills Academy for Rail. We we don't actually deliver any training, but we do um, quality assure training that goes on within the rail sector to make sure it uh, meets the high levels of, of um, health and safety. Um, and my role in particular is is focused more on the workforce analytics. But I'm sure we'll we'll come to that a little later. Yes, thank you, thank you, Michelle. And last but not least, uh, Dara, what does it mean to you? How are you, Mike? Um, okay, firstly, uh, I'm Dara Connolly. I'm Common Purposes CEO in Ireland, which is basically a global entity that uh, specialises in experiential learning around leadership, cultural uh, intelligence, uh, diversity, basically, how do we um, open people's minds as regards how other sectors are working and see if there's a cross-pollination of solutions that can be done uh, among leaders. <clears throat> Blended learning. Um, well, we've, as I said, we've been experiential learning for around 30 years now, and it's been flipped on its head. So we had a one dimensional element, in fact, bring people together, bring them into different organizations, different entities, be it a prison to a, a, a multinational um, and get them learning firsthand. So now it's very much human centered, human centered design. How do we actually get the most from the experiences? that we're, we're left with. Um, and that is very much uh, being as creative as possible, Mike, is the only way to describe it, asynchronous and synchronous. Good, and I know you're gonna come back on, on that. So uh, we've such a uh, huge experience here and all in different sectors. I'm going to go to each of you with a little different question so that the, the audience can, uh, the participants can actually get a sense of where you're coming from. And Kevin, I'm going to start with you again and just ask you, uh, I know you have huge experience and uh, I suppose this is a problem or, or a dilemma that many organizations are, are facing at the moment, how to move like Dara just described there, and I've had this discussion with Dara many times about moving from face to face uh, to online. And is it possible uh, in your experience to do that directly or what do we need to do to make it succeed? Um, so I think it, it, in simple terms, I think it is. I, I think it is and I think organizations have to use that phrase from, from tech, organizations have pivoted uh, over, over the last year to, to do just that. Um, and I think with varying degrees of success, organizations have been able to de deliver learning uh, online. I, I do think it, it creates probably three very interesting reflections for us. The first is, you know, is, is the learning experience comparable? Um, and I think, you know, we can there's probably an interesting debate and discussion there i think the second one is does it work for everything and you know we've seen e-learning emerge really since the mid 1990s um and, and take on different guises but i think that the jury's still out on whether or not virtual learning can can work for everything and i think the third one probably the most interesting one for me in terms of the next progression of learning is is this genuinely the best use of, of digital? Um, and, you know, do we just focus on digital repl replicating the delivery experience or is there more to come from digital um, in, in terms of how we learn, how we engage, how we interact with others? And just maybe to stick with that for a minute, do you believe that there is more we can get from it and is it more than just the transmission piece? I think it is, and I, I, I honestly think it has to be. Um, I think we have seen, um, you know, digital try and replicate a, a lot of what has happened in the classroom, I think, to, to varying degrees. I think once you're playing with increasing complexity, once you're trying to create shared meaning, and once you're trying to create a, an environment where people learn from each other, um, I think that becomes increasingly difficult to do, to do in an environment like this or Zooms or Teams or, or whatever it may be. But we have seen 
tools in other areas emerge, you know, that, that start to connect people, that promote social learning, that begin to facilitate learning transfer, that connect people in a way where feedback is developed. And they have a long way to go. But I think we're starting to see the emergence of digital tools that move beyond just distribution and actually support learning in, in multiple dimensions. Yeah, very interesting. And I, I know in my world, which is predominantly education and training, um, there, there are a lot of people are reflecting now that they have been doing too much of the delivery, um, as you said, the transmission type. So that's very interesting. And I think they will welcome those tools. And Laurie, I'm going to move on to you. And uh, both Kevin and I think even Dara mentioned it as well, this idea of social learning and, yeah. you know, learning, you know, a lot of us would say learning is a social activity. So yeah. can you explain what you mean by social learning in your world and how does it fit in with your vision and the work you're doing in relation to blended learning? Yeah, um, we focus a lot on neuroscience. So we're studying how does the brain work? How does the brain learn? And what we're teaching is neuroscience based, but also how we're delivering things we're trying to be. Uh, in line with what we know about how the brain learns. And a lot of learning needs to happen through, well, learning needs to happen through experience. And that can be shored up, is very strongly shored up by talking about it and sharing experiences. And I believe that's especially true with soft skills, leadership skills, those kind of skills. Um, that's the world that I'm in, so I don't know about technical skills and hard skills. But social learning for me are those conversations that happen between people. In our programs, we start out, so our blend is basically three things. We start out with a live webinar, large cohort, and we mm -hmm. pretty much insist that our programs are run in cohorts. Mm -hmm. So we have a large cohort, like 20 people run a webinar, and then they're off and running on their own. So they've got all the content is delivered online in a online platform. Yeah. But then there's the social learning aspect, which is built into the program. We put people in small learning groups, three to four people. Within the online platform are their learning group guides. We ask them to meet together once every chapter. The, the chapters themselves, the online content has activities to go do, apply this to your real world. Mm -hmm. So they go do those and then they come and they talk about it in their social learning groups. So that's what I mean, and it fits right in. And, and people tell me they like the different modalities that are happening in the same program. And they say the conversations with their colleagues are the things that bring it to life. Yeah, uh, huge fan of conversations. Um, I'm a big fan of the the work of you know around discussion as a method of teaching. So I, I can I can see that, and and it seems like that you're putting them into these kind of almost little communities that you're getting yes. them to to get to know each other. Yeah, and, and can I say one more thing do, do. about the the benefit that we it was a side benefit that we found. People as they're going through their um, self paced learning. Yeah. You know, people don't, aren't the best at staying up with that, right? But it's the social learning groups that are keeping people accountable. Mm. So it would it be really a little bit of competition there, Laurie? Not to let your not to let the side down if you're going to be meeting a colleague to discuss. Is that part of it? That's yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So I go do my things because I'm meeting my people. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it's um it's a fabulous side benefit of having those social yeah. groups. No, no, I, I'm a huge fan of that. I mean, again, going back to what Kevin was saying there a minute ago, <laughs> I was with a group recently who had never been in breakouts and they were like, Oh my god, this is great. Mm. Uh, you know, but they had been just been on a diet of just pure you know, webinars and just listening passively. And then they really love the, the chance to get together. So I suppose just finally, from your experience, do you think we can recreate the social learning online like we would when we're in face to face, you know, uh, that cup of coffee, sitting down at the table, getting to chat with people? Yes. Is it the same or is it different? Well, I think it's different because there isn't that, that personal interaction. But I've had many groups just love their learning group, even though they've never physically met I've had people continue their conversations after our program ended because they built such nice connections. We also, the conversations that we invite people to have are a bit on the vulnerable side. So, you know, open up with this personal development and that creates connection between people, even if it's virtual. So it, no, it's not exactly the same, but it can, I think it can be just as powerful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think you're touching on mindfulness and all of that good side of things there as well when you are connecting them like that. Yes. And we, in the beginning of those groups, we, we asked them to create a, an alliance, some kind of agreements together. We're going to be on a journey together. How do we, you know, and that helps them set the stage for themselves and create a little bit of that vulnerability from the beginning. Perfect. 
And then I'm going to go to Michelle. And Michelle, uh, you touched on it there. You're involved in the exciting area of analytics um, again. Mm. And a lot of people are excited about AI and analytics. And I read in your bio that uh, you've been doing some interesting work with uh, something called the skills intelligent model. So we, we, we couldn't go through a session without jargon. So you have to explain <laughs> to me what that is and what it does and why we should be interested in this and, and how it could help us. Well, the, the, the skills intelligence model is um, it, it's a tool that we use to help um, organisations within the rail sector um, develop a strategic workforce plan. So it's probably the stage before the training. So we help organisations um, take account of what their future needs are going to be. Um, so it has uh, four elements, really. The first is you take an audit of what skills you've got within your workforce today. So you know where you're at. Stage two is you look at the uh, investment plan going forward where the where the business is looking to invest or, or grow or diversify um, and putting those two combinations of things together. You can identify what your future demand uh, workforce would look like from a skills perspective. Um, and then step four is identifying where those gaps exist. And then the strategic workforce plan comes in addressing those gaps. So do you look to recruit new people with those skills that are ready made? Or do you look to reskill or retrain people within your own organisation? And then that's where, um, you know, the learning aspect comes in. So we, we can guide organisations to um, the, the most appropriate people within their workforce through conversation about who would be ideal to upskill, looking at the profile of skills and competencies that they, they currently have um, and moving forward. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very, very useful within the sector. So am I hearing it's really like a tool to help you make good decisions around the people that you have within your organisation to bring them on and other, also maybe that if you need to bring people in from outside? Absolutely. Um, and we we diversified ourselves. So um, it, it's a, it, the model can be sector agnostic. It doesn't just have to apply to the rail sector, but that's where we're predominantly based. So that's where, where we use it. But yeah, essentially that. So the, the key point is understanding the landscape of your workforce as it is today and what it needs to be going forward so that you can then work um, with a variety of training providers to to, to fill those gaps. Um, and I'm sure you're aware in the UK um, at the moment, there's a uh, the apprenticeships agenda is quite high. Um, so looking at how apprenticeships can be brought into the sector um, and the learning programmes that, that they're following um, and just building on, on the training aspect. We've done not my team, but other parts of the organisation have worked with um, apprenticeship deliverers um, to diversify how, how they're delivering during these difficult COVID times to ensure that the apprentices can still receive their training and still um, get to their endpoint assessment so they can pass their qualifications. Um, so so we've supported um, the adaptations that have been required there. So, I mean, the, the apprenticeship agenda here is is very high at the moment as well. And um, in fairness to Solace and to our new minister, Simon Harris, it's really on the agenda. And I actually, during the week, I was uh, in contact with a group in uh, Lim Limerick Clare um, Education Training Board who are leading the National Apprenticeship in Hairdressing. Um, you can see I know a lot about it. But uh, um, I was just struck by how creative they were around um, putting their blend together for hairdressing with mannequins mm. going home and all the rest of it in a blend. Um, just curious for a minute, how do you do blended learning in something as I would imagine technical and as hands-on as um, uh, you know engineering for railway technicians or whatever, what positions or how does that work? And I think I think that's where the, the blended learning comes into its own right. So um, as Kevin already alluded to, the mix between face to face and online learning. So the technical textbook stuff you could do through um, workshops online, you could you could do background reading. But for the practical assessments that would need to be done on site um, and therefore it's up to the, the, the assessors or the, the employers to make sure that, that site is COVID safe as we're you know, in the climate we're in at the moment so that um, candidates are able to socially distant yes. um sorry socially distance um and and stay safe um and from the assessments that have taken place you know the wearing of face masks has been has been mandatory um and as far as i'm aware all of the assessments that have taken place have been carried out safely um and nobody has, has caught the disease which is which is fantastic news well i'll be talking to you afterwards because this is a hot topic over here at the moment uh, particularly among oh. tv 
about how to continue with assessments because typically a lot of exams face to face would have been happening in the next month or two. Mm. So it's it's a it's a hot topic. Thanks for that, Michelle. Really interesting. No and I'm on, uh, that's brilliant. And I'm going to move on to Dara. And of course, Dara, I know you of old, and you touched on it there. Um, I suppose your workshops are really interesting. They're they're you know they're not your typical leadership program. Uh, yeah. I I did one where I where we were walking the streets of Dublin. Um, I mean, how do you reimagine that for an online world at the moment, where you don't even have that chance to do blended? Where, as Michelle talked yeah. about face to face, that's off the table at the moment. So, from a creativity point of view, which you touched on earlier, how do you do this? Okay, um, yeah, what well, we call them immersions, uh, and so we basically kind of. Before uh, before the, the period we're in now, it was very much a real life learning, getting people into the basis, mm -hmm. but also learn about all different elements of an organization from the leader and uh, to middle management down to the stakeholder. So you get a whole holistic view of actually where the culture and the leadership culture tr trickles down. Yeah. So how do we do that um, in this world? Now, it's a very interesting space that we're in because it's necessity now. There is no other choice, right? So people can actually lower their kind of expectations. If they go in thinking that they're going to get exactly the face-to-face, -face, they're ultimately going to be uh, disappointed. So, but how do you replicate that kind of immersive place, that, 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 that real-life learning? It's really thinking outside the box. And it's, it's very much about being relevant and timely, um, Mick, because, you know, if there's a subject that has just happened, yeah. that is something that will engage somebody. Black Lives Matter, for example. Yes. You know, if you if you went onto a program and you're talking about real life learning and you actually ignored something as significant as what happened two weeks ago, presidential Capitol Hill kind of scenario, you have to hit these things and that will actually get people engaged from the start. As regards processes, how do you get that? Context is all important. But again, thinking outside the box, we've used drones, for example, as regards how to go over a space and actually take a look at an organization like Abbottstown and, um, for Sports Ireland in Dublin. Um, uh, live streams where you actually create a 3D model where you don't actually have uh, this face-to-face -face model that we're talking about now where you actually have a screen set up, you get a bank of cameras, you get a speakers on social distance, of course, yes. and then you've got, say, a large screen behind it. So if Mary asks a question of John, who's one of the speakers, they're actually talking one to one to each other, so that creates an intimacy, yes. you know. Um, I mean, there's even scenarios where we've replicated the, the immersive piece of actually going in and learning about an organisation by actually giving the camera to somebody who's working there, and they walk through the place, or else they create a video. So there's all different ways to actually um, to actually replicate the experience. But one thing that we found very useful where we're actually talking to organizations, we'd ask them to say, what would you like to say? You know, we, we were in a prison on the 16th of December uh, and we ba they basically created, had a video that they used about three years ago, which showed the prison experience and how um, the leadership did, and setting a culture from that, from the governor down, actually created an openness for actually real life learning, lifelong learning within the prison itself. And that's an amazing learning for a senior leader to come in and to see that. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with the, where there's a will, there's a way, Mick, and it's very much thinking outside the box and thinking about what is important now, what do people want to listen to. Um, Laurie, everything Laurie said there, 100% agree with her, uh, bringing them down into small groups. But we work with groups of 200, we bring it down to 30 in, in the uh, in the. Um, local scene to 200 or international, then into the learning groups and then into the uh, coaching one to one. So that's a kind of a pyramid approach. So you're getting all the different levels. So, but yeah. what, are, what are the like you were very much in the leadership space, and I could see when Laurie was speaking that you were um, you were very much um, nodding in agreement, and I could see a lot of of uh, crossover there. I, I suppose, what are some of the lessons do you think if somebody is in leadership that you know to move it online? What do you what do you you know, if there was two or three just quick ones that you see okay. that might be a might be possible, Dara. Okay, first of all, when you're designing your programs, you have to bring it from 
every level. You have to bring marketing, you have to bring tech, you have to bring the actual programming piece. So it has to be a completely looking at all different angles coming in. Does the tech piece marry with the with the real life learning, with the the the, 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 the engagement piece? Okay, that's the first part, right? Um, people need to speak to people at the moment. Again, we're talking about now. So how do you get them talking? So conversation catalyst, what we call contributors or speakers, we actually call them conversation catalysts. So we bring them in and we say, get them talking, get them thinking, get them engaging, get them asking questions. Bring in the speaker, then bring them in, put them into small groups, get them talking among themselves, and then bring them back and actually discuss what was done in this small groups. So that engagement piece is absolutely key. Um, yeah, and think about the people in front of you. What do they want to talk about? What's the important piece that they want to talk about now? Um, we were doing programs in January. God help people doing things in the first two weeks of January. Their hearts are broken coming on, on the screen. Going, so how do you do it? You bring in a coach, you bring in um, people that are going to be very, very positive. They're going to lift it. It might be a certain time where you bring it back down to kind of the reality of today. But So very, very much a kind of creative, lateral thinking approach. Yeah. And a very connected approach, I think, as well, um, as I hear you say. And I'm just going to wrap with this because I'm sure Chris has some questions that are coming in there. Um, but I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to Laurie this time and to Michelle and Kevin. And then just very quickly, uh, maybe in 60 seconds or less, uh, you know, I, I, I we're all talking about the period we're in at the moment. I call it DC during COVID. I call it AC um, after COVID. So that's what I'm looking uh, to hear. And I just wonder in a couple of a quick uh, prediction on where you see the future of learning post-COVID. Laurie? I think it's going to be more blended. I don't think we're going back to where we were a year ago. Yeah, good. Michelle? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think um, I think blended is the way forward, um, and and developing better than what we what we're currently using. Um, so so during this COVID period, some people have had to adapt quickly. So other people have had time to develop their their learning platforms and their online offer. And I think that that opportunity will continue to grow. And I think we'll see more of that um, in FE and HE as well. Yes. Yeah. No. No. I think I think you're right. And and of course, you know, blended learning we have to say has been around. Again, I gave a talk recently, I call it second coming of blended learning. They're on for 25 years. Uh, Kevin, um, what's your future predictions? I, I, I agree with, with the others. I think I think it's blended. I think it's a, probably a smarter version than, than we have now, uh, yes. hopefully slightly better tools. But I think also a very considered view of when we need to bring people together face to face, we're doing it with a specific purpose. And that may be to create social networks that will sustain themselves perhaps virtually or or to some of the the points dara touched on sometimes you can only create a, a, a specific experience in in a visceral way in a, in a physical way um, and people can only get a sense of a particular place when they're actually there so i think we'll, we'll be smarter about when we, we choose to bring people together yeah, no, I, and I think so. And I think actually I'm hearing from you in particular, I know the others, it's there as well. It's this thing of design. You're designing. What's your purpose? Yeah. And thinking about it from that perspective. And Dara, the final word with you before I go to Chris. I just, um, I, it definitely blending. That's the obvious answer. Uh, where will be the classroom be? Will we go back into a 30, 40 p uh, seated or will we use theatres? Will we use uh, conference centres as they use for the doll over here? Um, that kind of different approach, what is safe, people are going to be looking for things that are different going forward. But I tell you one thing, people are mad to meet each other again. Yes. So if you can facilitate that in some way, yeah. happy days, then, then, then you cracked it. Yeah, you see, that's a good Corkman there. He likes to go for a pint in the chat. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> I miss Chris, that boy, I can tell you that. <laughs> Grace, over to you. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, fascinating conversation going on. I did also launch a poll just uh, a few moments ago there. So you will see a little poll section. It is, what do you see as the future for blended learning? Um, the overwhelming response at the moment is a blended or hybrid approach where we have a mix of face-to-face -face and online. Um, does that surprise anybody at all? 
Uh, I think so. I think that's what's really come out of all of but this. But I, I think, um, Chris, there, just to add to that, I think it's what Kevin has been articulating there. I mean, I think, you know, as he said at the very outset, you know, the very narrow definition of blended being face to face and online, it, 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 that, that was that was that was established 2004 by Garrison and Kanuka. It's, it, you know, it's kind of a, a, a key article in this whole space. But I think now people are, are really pulling it apart and I'm delighted to hear that it's such that our panel has such a wide um, understanding or not understanding, but a, a, an expectation in terms of the blend. I think that's really where where I think the excitement um, is. And, and this isn't a, a, a sector I would be in dealing with on a daily basis. So for me, it's very uplifting to hear that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, does anybody else have anything to add on that at all? If not, I can um, invite some no, questions. No, People can, sorry. So, sorry, Chris, just, just the one point, because I can, I the chat stream coming up beside me and there's been a couple of comments about yeah. the need to design virtual sessions differently to face-to-face. -to -face. So it's not a straightforward migration from face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to virtual. And I, I, I completely agree with it. We've got to, um, I think it was Laurie mentioned earlier, you know, we've got to think about where our learners are. And we know that people have Zoom fatigue. We know that there's cognitive overload. And, you know, we know that people's attention spans are, are limited. So we have to, if we're, when we're thinking about blending and moving material online and moving sessions online, we have to conceptualize them and design them in, in quite a different way. Thanks. Okay. Um, just looking, there are a couple of questions there. Um, I have here, um, the more we do online, the more uh, sedentary and inert our workforce becomes, which brings many health concerns. Do we think we have a responsibility wow. as trainers to incorporate some movement or uh, physicality into online learning sessions? Or would you suggest this be entirely based on the learners' views and preferences? That comes from Cheryl Burrows. Um, I'll throw that, throw that to whoever wants to take that one on. I will say something similar, but I, um, it's part of, we, we have to move, our bodies have to move it in order for our brains to work. So if we let this sedentary thing happen, you know, it's, it's not just their responsibility, but our responsibility if we want learning to happen, to get them up and moving, encourage people to have standing desks or whatever it is, to, you know, frequent breaks. I even take people on stretch, but you know, have them stretch and touch their toes and things like that. It's important. Yeah, yeah. we we, <laughs> we do that, Laurie, as well. It's it's yeah. especially if you're doing it at nine o'clock in the morning or two yeah. o'clock in the afternoon when they just had a lovely lunch. You gotta you gotta wake them up a bit. So absolutely, yeah. get them moving and stretching. But we I think have, uh, I think I think Chris, what that is what that is getting back to again is that this idea we have these tools and you know as we've mentioned we, we're going to get better tools, but it's about designing so that it's good learning. You know I think that's that's ultimately what what sometimes gets lost here. We can get a little bit too hung up on just delivering all the time, and that's where the overload etc comes in. So I mean a lot of what we've heard in this panel is about in, is connecting and interaction and which is mm -hmm. really a part of good learning. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we'll have time for one more question. I think there seems to have a, a quite a few votes on this one. It is in terms of deskless and distributed workers like manufacturing, logistics, etc. The delivery of learning is only heading in one way uh, to the employee's own mobile device. How does the panel suggest a company gets their employees to download something to their own device to access the learning? Yeah, pretty. Pretty good question. That's a. Um, does somebody want to take a, a lead on that question? Yeah, I'll I'll kick that one off. Um, I think there are issues around around data security in in that sense, um, and making sure that um, if you're asking uh, your employees to do that, it's with a valid reason, um, and and it's justifiable because t I suppose in want of a better phrase, it's an invasion of their personal space, and you're pushing work into the the personal sp sphere. Um, but equally, I think that comes down to the, the culture of your organisation. If, if training and learning is part of your ongoing culture, then it won't be an issue for employees to, to engage in that and, and take that on board. Um, and for, for where, it's, where it's a problem, um, there are organisations that issue with employees with, with devices. Um, and that's, 
that's an alternative solution that, that the software is already on that device if it's company issued. But I think mm. if you get the culture within your organisation right, we're all here to learn. A phrase I use with my team every day is every day's a school day because um, the aim is that you're always learning learning something new. And if that culture is embedded, then it, it sh in my view, it shouldn't be an issue for employees to engage and, and download that, that app or piece of software. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. I, th I think that's... Um... Chris, can I, can I just pick up on one of the, 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 the messages there? Somebody talked about leaving it, opening up the, 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 the Zoom meetings 15 minutes beforehand. I think that's a very important point as regards kind of the flexibility within the programs now, especially when you're actually in an online place and you can't actually read the body language of the individuals there, even though you can see 30 people on the screen, you can see actually whether they're um, with you or not. But that whole piece of we, we sometimes, we do that, we open it before, but we also let it out, let it go after the period of time. So you give an optional space for people just to actually chat. So in other words, you take the wind out of the actual intensity of the learning and let them unwind within the space um, and talk and basically talk about what they really want to talk about. But also within the programs themselves, give a bit of leeway of five to 10 minutes between each session because I've been on programs and talked to people and it's, it's like a guillotine coming down. Your time is up, bang, you're gone, midpoint. You have to leave that flexibility for letting people to flow because people want to talk to them. People want to connect to them. Yeah. So I just, just sort of address that in the chat. Just Dara, someone has put in there, they call it, the, I've never seen this before, the virtual parking lot. So I, I think it's, a, it's one I'll be borrowing. <laughs> okay, that's like the virtual parking lot. <laughs> Um, it's quite similar. We what we did with this platform that I, the first one I time I've used it, but it allowed that what you were saying um, there, Dara. That it allowed that conversation to start probably ten days ago. That just sort of yeah. built a lot of interest and that sort of um, a little bit of a collaborative feel to it. Um, even though we are at a distance, it just sort of for me brought that closeness in. So I think that's um, I really understand what you're saying there. Uh, if there's any other questions, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so I think we can probably start to wrap up unless, uh, Michael, you had anything else you wanted to address or talk about at all or any of the other uh, panellists? No, no I, I, just, I just suppose just from a, a, moderator, a moderator's perspective and um, with the four speakers that we had on the panel with such diverse backgrounds and the work that they're do, doing, I, I think it's really, um, really great to get that and to see that there's an awful lot of commonality even though they're in different spheres, that there's a commonality in approach and perspective. And I think, you know, I, I think blended learning, like the European Commission is going to have a council recommendation on blended learning over the next while. So it's a hot topic. And I think, you know, uh, it needs, the, the conversations need to go wider than just schools and uh, universities, it needs to go into workplace as well, because uh, this is the future. So that, that's all I'd say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, it's been a wonderful session. I think the, um, many people in the audience uh, would agree with that. Great session. Thank you. So, yeah, I'd just like to second that. Thanks again. Uh, and we can wrap up and we'll prepare for our next session. But I'd be very happy if you uh, you wanted to stick around and watch um, the rest of the day. Um, by all means, do so. But um, I'll let you back out now into the audience. And thanks again. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye. 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 And thanks again, Michael, uh, for moderating. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. You're welcome, Chris. Take care. Talk Take to care you now. Bye bye. All right, fantastic. What a discussion uh, to come back to after the break. Um, really enjoyable. Thanks for all your comments and, and the questions. I will um, move on now and I will prepare for our uh, next session, which will be starting probably another four to five minutes. So uh, once again, grab a tea break and we'll be back shortly. Thank you.
Okay, almost ready to go. I'll bring my next moderator up, Roshin McBride. Yeah, Roshin, just accept your camera and microphone. Hi, Chris. Hey, Roshin. How are you doing? Good. That's the way we can see here. I might just pop you on mute just for a moment uh, while I get the rest of your speakers up. And I have Carmel coming on as well. Carmel, I will just invite you onto the screen. And the same for Jason. I invite you onto the screen as well now, Jason. Just accept your camera and microphone. Might take a few seconds. Hello, Carmel. Hi, Chris. Great to see you again. And you. Hi, Roisin. Bring her off in a second. She's just on the other side of the room, so. Echo, uh, Joe Moffat, I'll bring you onto the screen as well. And I have Dr. Rich Atkins to come on as well. Hey, Rich is there, I'm pretty sure. Yes, Rich, I'll bring you on as well. I'll just get started. I can see Rich is just declining there. I'll be able to get him on. It seems to be happening in every session. Rich, if you're there, just wait there a moment and I will get you connected in no time. But I'll get the session started first and turn my own camera off. So let me just get this down and introduce you to, uh, first of all, my uh, moderator is my esteemed colleague, Roshi McBride, uh, who's part of the marketing team here at Envolve and has a, a passion and interest in all types of digital marketing and media. So uh, thanks, Roshi, for putting your hand up to do one of the sessions. I appreciate it. No problem, Chris. Uh, we can hear you perfectly there. So what I'll do is I will um, I'll come off screen now and I'll hand it over to you and you can introduce our guests. I'll go and get Rich for you and he'll turn up as well. So thanks and I'll see you shortly. So thanks everyone for joining me here today on this session. Um, we're just going to have a talk about the best practices for di the digital employee experience. And I'll just start off by introducing um, the panelists here. So today we have um, Carmel Summers. So Carmel is the human capital strategist at, Te at Technology Ireland ICT SkillsNet. And she is an experienced organizational psychologist, as well as having previously been the talent manager at IBM. So it's nice to meet you, Carmel. And you, Roisin. Thank you. And next, I will introduce Jason Sinclair. So Jason is a partner um, people officer and management consultant at the Queensbury Group. And Jason has an extensive experience in human resources, all around talent, learning, organizational development, professional development, and especially equality, diversity, and inclusion. Hi, Jason. Thank you. And as well, we have Joe, um, Joe Moffat. So Joe is the strategy director of the Engage for Success movement. Um, she's also the MD and founder of Woodread. Um, Woodread is a specialist ad agency who use the tools, techniques, creativity, and insight of the advertising world to engage um, employees within their organizations. Hi, Joe. It's good to have you back. <laughs> oh, you're just on mute. You're still on mute there, Joe. Oh, we seem to have been we having an issue yeah. with Joe being stuck on mute. So Chris is going to work on that for us. And then um, last but not least, we have Dr. Rich Atkins. So Rich is a speaker, trainer, managing and managing director at Improving Communications UK. And he has a strong focus on training programs, having developed and delivered his own programs um, throughout the past. So welcome, Rich, as well. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Um, it's good to have you back as well, Jason. So for anybody who doesn't know, Joe and Jason actually took part in our last event, which was um, the Workforce Excellence Conference back in September. And we've actually had Joe on our podcast as well a couple of times. So it's good to see some familiar faces. Good to be back. <laughs> So I suppose I'll start off then with a question. Um, I'll just kind of um, leave this up to everyone. So the first question is, um, will all employee experience, whether it's learning, uh, engagement, progression, improvement, et cetera, become uh, digital? Or is there anything left for the human to human side of employee experience? I suppose, Carmel, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah, thanks, Roshi. Um, okay, so I think, you know, at a very base minimum, you know, we are very much social beings. Um, and I think from a lot of the sessions we've seen this morning and just even the last one, um, our need for that human contact um, is really important. And I think while technology is being developed and lots of organizations are putting things in like chatbots and um, different ways to, to sort of, I suppose, enhance the employee experience in a digital world, I don't think it, it will get away from us needing to have those one-to-one -one sessions, be it with our managers, be it with a coach or a mentor um, as, we, as we progress through our careers. And what's your opinions on um, that, Rich? Do you think um, there will be anything left for the human-to-human -human side of employee experience? Absolutely, there will be, but the benefit, believe it or not, the benefit of lockdown has caused us to rethink priorities. So uh, we're now considering what's the value of my commute versus the value of my work. Uh, where can I achieve work-life bonus? What are the real estate costs for a company? All of these weigh in to our need for learning. But what we do have to do is consider that that in order to be effective, some learning has to be face to face. Uh, for instance, physical work. If we're training someone to do something physical, they can sit in a chair and, and look at a screen, but until they actually do it, then it's not experiential until they do that. So we're gonna have to find that balance. And this has been the opportunity, the great experiment to try it. And now we'll see how we can perfect it. And what's your say on that, Jason? Do you think all employee experiences will become digital or do you still think there's um, the human to human side is still important? It's definitely still important. And I think there's, there's certain areas where I'd say it's absolutely crucial. Um, for instance, when we're, we're bringing new people into our organization, there's certain aspects around that, that recruitment life cycle where I feel that absolutely you, you know, the human to human is, is incredibly important. Um, and it's, it, it, I mean, even more so when it's we're talking about early in careers. So, so people that are perhaps new to the workplace full stop and they, they've not had any previous experience. I think for them, especially, there needs to be some some human to human involvement. There. I agree with that. Yeah, I do. Um, what I'll do is I'll come back to Joe if we can get her back on again. And I'll ask her that question a little bit later on. Um, but I'm going to come back to you now, Carmel, and I am just going to ask you a quick question on oh do we have joe back nope still not okay sorry carmel i'll just um i'm just gonna ask you so in your experience um what are some of the positive and negative changes you've seen regarding digital transformation um for employee experience okay so yeah and it, it's it's such a big broad area so um, i'm going to just pick um two i think um so the first one i think i'll pick is you know human management um um, systems or human capital systems so what we've seen is you know huge progress over the last you know probably close to, to eight to ten years now with organizations implementing um, systems to help you know employees to navigate through the organization and to you know kind of have as much self-service as possible in terms of things that they need to do you know whether that's on a regular basis or an occasional basis so if we think about things like i move house and i want to update my details i can now do that online most organizations have systems that allow you to do that um, and to do things like get a letter to state i'm in full employment if i want to go for um, a say for a mortgage um so Companies have been really good at putting that in, in place. We've also seen it with learning and development systems where um, now you can find just the right piece of learning um, when you need it uh, to, you know, to, 
for whatever reason. So whether it's a full blown course I want to do or whether it's just bite sized learning to help me to to move to the next stage of something that I'm working on um, um, in my my daily tasks. Um, so we've seen a lot of progression in those spaces and um, what we, I suppose the negatives that, that I would uh, and have seen and, uh, with both of those areas is that I think from a, from a HR point of view, we've seen, you know, kind of growing focus on processes and, and on digital transformation. But quite often, I think now we're beginning to see that um, human resources has very much become process driven and we're seeing a little bit of a step away from the strategic side of you know, transformation in the business that HR really needs to be part of. So I suppose if that's the negative, that's the negative side of that that I've seen. And I think, um, you know, HR needs to very much come back to the strategy table and to engage more in transformation going forward. Um, and I think on the learning and development side, I think we have to be careful that we don't overload people with the tools and the courses and the content and fail to curate it. Um, that's it's one of the things that we hear of so often is that you know I have these great resources available to me but I almost don't know where to start I don't know what to pick so I think we need to remember that you know those systems need to be connected and ideally your HR and your, your L&D systems and also that we need to kind of curate it we need to be able to show somebody what they need to do based on where they are at at a given time so I guess those would be my positive and negatives of both of those in terms of employee experience. And um, do you have any examples, Carmel, of where technology has helped with career prog progression and broadening of the skills of employees? Yeah, okay, so I, I'll go back to, um, I, I previously worked with, with IBM um, up until about a year and a half ago, and something they implemented, um, which kind of blew my mind when it came in, and it's probably there five or six years at this stage, but um, they have a, a, a HRM system and they also have um, a learning and development system called Your Learning. But one of the things that it was really good at facilitating and that's what uh, it's multi-directional career progression. So if, for example, say when I was there and let's say I was managing a, a technical team, I had my that career profile was mapped. Um, it also kept track of the skills that I had. But it actually allowed me to look at a range of other jobs that I was on the spectrum for. So, for example, I might look at it and it might say to me, well, actually, you could take on a leadership role in consulting services or in uh, maybe uh, in, in a, a customer facing role where technology was required and I had the technology skills. But maybe I needed to grow the software skills or maybe I have the soft skills and I needed to grow some of the technology skills. So, but not only that, it actually linked. So it would tell me here are a range of jobs that you're suitable for and you've got maybe 75% of the skills for or 50% of the skills for, but it also linked to the hiring system. So it would show me the, the, the roles that were open across the organization, which I could obviously narrow down to Ireland if I only wanted a role in Ireland. Um, and it, it just obviously it's based on AI and you know, you're keeping your profile up to date, but um, it was one really positive thing. And I think something that organizations need to consider going forward because we're very much seeing that that ability to move sideways in an organization is as important as the ability to move, um, you know, vertically in the organization and this facilitated both. So um, yeah, so I think that would be an example. Thank you, Carmel. So, um, Rich, I'm going to ask you my next question now. So, um, my question for you now is, what do you think companies can do to improve training programs from a digital perspective? And I suppose this kind of ties in with um, with what Carmel was kind of talking about there as well. Sure. Increasing engagement is the key here because we've all been on webinars. We've all sat in sessions where it's just a barrage of information coming at us. And there comes a point where people's brains reach saturation, they gray out. Uh, I had to look up the definition of engagement just to, to get a perspective on this. Engagement means, according to Merriam-Webster, to be present, to have an emotional involvement or commitment, being in gear. The last definition was a hostile encounter between military forces. I don't think we should use that one for this sort of uh, venue. But the idea here is if our learners, if our employees are engaged in some way, 
they have some sort of commitment and, and involvement in what's going on, they're going to be present. So uh, an example here is we had to transition quickly from being a face-to-face -face learning company to a digital one. And one of my employees is brilliant at doing this. And, you know, I, I know he's giving a class when I hear my tablet blowing up, because what that is, is him on team saying, okay, respond in the chat and, and answer whether or not you like doing, you know, whatever, whatever he's talking about, he's getting them to give answers or, or, or engage in some way. And it's constant. It's, it's just ongoing. So engagement is really the answer. It's, it's the way to, to get people in. Uh, we avoid lecture as much as possible. We, uh, we get, you have to get people to react at least every five minutes. You have to get them to give some kind of input. If not, they're, they're checked out. Uh, we require cameras to be on for our sessions so that we can gauge people's in involvement. Uh, we use a lot of the breakout and we call them collaboration rooms, especially in teams, because in teams you have the possibility of file storage and you have file sharing. So, uh, pardon me, file collaboration. So people can uh, contribute and, and, and really be part of the session. Uh, and the, the final thing is to limit class size. If you have more than 10 or so, 15 people in a class, it just becomes a one-way information blast. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to ask you another question there, Rich. So do you see like um, a lot of increased engagement from using things like breakout rooms and making sure that people have their cameras and things like this turned on? Because I know that a lot of the time, people would have a tendency to kind of turn their camera off, put themselves on mute, and then, you know, kind of try and hide away from, from the training, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and I question at that point what they're doing. I mean, for all I know, they could be off getting a cup of coffee or they could be checking other programs, checking their emails, checking their social media, uh, getting ahead on, on other projects at work. We want them to be part of the learning. And, and so if, the client supports that and says, yes, you know, we've engaged with you to, to provide learning. Whatever you say goes, that's when we have their support. That's when we can make these uh, requirements. If the, the client is, is just checking a box, then we're, uh, we're left with however they want to approach it. And do you have many examples or even one in particular, I suppose, that you could kind of um, think of as where organizations have transitioned well from a traditional class based training to a digital program? Yes. Uh, great question. Thank you for that. There's uh, we do a lot of work with utilities and also sports and entertainment businesses. So with the utility, you have to remember they are a learning organization because safety is everything. If they're not safe, people get hurt or people die. So they need to keep learning going. March 13th here in the United States came and that's when everything got shut down and, and I got the call, Rich, we're gonna push trainings out for who knows how long, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too long after that that I called them and I said, you know we do all this stuff online and we're doing communication skills training, we're doing public speaking, presentation skills, uh, a number of critical thinking courses that they need in order to be safe. So that's when they came back to us and said, what do you propose? How are we gonna get through this? They, we had only done face to face, but here was their opportunity to transition, to pivot quickly, to try it out, make our mistakes. We can make mistakes in a classroom. That's the best thing to do. Make a mistake in a classroom because when ultimately a utility worker gets out on a pole, we wanna make sure that they don't make mistakes. So here we were trying things out and, and getting better and better. And as we did, the engagement increased and, and we had great results as, as, as we've seen. 
Perfect. So Jason, I'm finally going to come up to you. Well, not finally, I suppose, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to come up to you now. Um, and I'm just going to ask you, so I know that a lot of your work is um, kind of based around or like focused around equality, diversity and inclusion. And that would be a big focus for yourself. So um, in relation to your work in diversity and inclusion in the workplace, how does technology help you achieve success? I think one of the things that's great about the, the different platforms and things that we can utilize is, is that more people can get involved in conversations. And I think what we're certainly encouraging our clients to do is have more facilitated conversations with different levels of their organizations when it comes to addressing either issues or problems and that, that require some learning. Um, where where we've had quite a lot of of discussion obviously is it recently has still there's lots of discussions around gender there's lots of discussions around race but of course you know all nine protected characteristics need to be addressed and i think that being digital does allow us to do that um one of the other things that that we've been saying to to clients is to make sure that in terms of when they're um, inviting people onto to platforms to, to learn about their business or maybe discuss that with people that are outside of their organization to make sure that they're inviting as many different people as possible to those conversations within their organization because it, it's better not just to, from a representational point of view but it's also much more useful and interesting for people from the outside looking in to get a, you know, a variety of people with different perspectives expressing you know their journeys into the organization and how they've got uh, into their relative positions and, and things of that nature that that's really useful one of the things um I, I wanted to to point out as well because we're talking a lot about obviously learning development and how you know working on digital platforms can aid that one of the other things that's to balance that out is also being aware of well-being um and and obviously digital fatigue <laughs> Uh, with with all the people that we're, we're involving, so um, where it's you know there may be certain people in a certain department that are always involved in certain meetings or facilitations, learning and development. It's trying to rotate that as well to make sure that everybody's given equal chance for downtime and, and you know away from screen time as well. I see we have Joe back here as well. Welcome back, Joe. It's Hi, rubbish. Joe. It's rubbish picture though, isn't it? I'm on, I'm oh, it'll be fine I'm as long as. If we can hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? I'm doing it on yeah. my phone. So you're probably, the camera's probably going up my nose or something. <laughs> oh, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there we go. Whoops. Um, so Jason, I just have, an, oh, sorry, another question for you. Um, so has COVID and working from home presented many opportunities to improve diversity or has it made the job more difficult? Um, and do you have some examples that you could you could share with us around this? It, has, it hasn't made it more difficult. I think there's there's lots there's lots of things at play, obviously, um, with with COVID and, and being at home. But what what it has allowed is for more thought and actually time to think about diversity initiatives um, and working specifically around inclusion and how to be more inclusive. Um, learning how to be inclusive digitally is actually a little bit more difficult, um, but it requires more thought. Um, and and I think. Like one of the earlier sessions we talked about you know it, it's not possible to transport things that we were doing in person straight onto you know into a digital framework without some thought and design work being done um, and i think that this covid has allowed more businesses and organizations to sit and design uh, what they want to do around inclusion and diversity so I, I found it quite useful and helpful and there's been much more discussion um, and, and lots of different ways to plug into those discussions during this period yeah, I suppose that now finally um, it has, I suppose, as you say, given businesses more time to actually take things that have previously been been set aside and kind of take them to the front and start to work on things that, you know, you really should be there, but just kept getting pushed aside. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, there, there has been some examples of, uh, particularly within um, sort of the tech space, we've been working with a few organisations there where they've, because tech is so fast moving and you're always on a hamster wheel, they've not perhaps had as much time um, in, in ordinary times to, to sit and address inclusion and diversity and, and sort of practically do something about it in the same way that they have done during lockdown. So all three lockdowns have presented opportunities for uh, different organisations to actually sit and collaborate and talk about what type of initiatives they would want to do, uh, actually bring people in to have discussions and have 
more roundtables and virtual sessions with other organizations outside of tech to, to borrow some ideas um, that can be useful to the tech world. And equality, um, diversity and inclusion should really sort of be at the forefront of uh, your mind as well when you're when you really are starting to put together your employee experience and everything that that makes up the employee experience too. Absolutely. Yep. So Joe, finally we got you we got you here. <laughs> it took a little while, but at Sorry least you made it. That. Yeah. No, it's fine, don't worry. So there's a question I asked everyone at the start, Joe. I'm just gonna come back and ask you now. And I asked, um, well, will all employee experience, whether it's learning, engagement, progression, improvement, etc., um, eventually become digital? And um, is there anything left for the human to human side of employee experience? Oh my God! Isn't that a desperate thought? It's it's uh, it's. I, I think you know the only I didn't unfortunately didn't get to hear what the rest of the panelists had to say, but I suspect that we're probably all of one mind on that. Um, we what from my point of view, what tech does and what digital transformation does is enable us to be more human. It should be automating and taking away the things that take up the time that get in the way of us being more human. So as far as I'm concerned, every single tech development, every single digital development simply creates further opportunities for us to fill that space that's been created with more humanity. And I think picking up, picking up very much there on, on, on Jason's last point about thought everything that we need to do around digital transformation is 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 has to be done in the context of realizing that this gives us the opportunity to be more thoughtful about what we're doing to be more intentional about the employee experience we shape and not to assume that tech is the silver bullet the goal you know the the answer to everything oh we've got the channel we've got the platform we've got the tool job done actually no we've got the channel we've got the platform we've got the tool great that now frees us up to be more thoughtful, taking on board Jason's point, to be more intentional about crafting a really inclusive employee experience and really engaging employee experience and one that works for everybody in the hybrid work workplace that we know is kind of here to stay, really. So in your experience then, Joe, how can you see the digital employee experience becoming an important factor for businesses now and in the future? Um, for that, really, yep. I mean, you know, the the hybrid workplace um, isn't going away anywhere fast. In fact, I hope it's never going to go away. Um, but you know, that hybrid workplace has to work for everybody, and that can really only be enabled by 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 digital and by tech. I mean, if we think about where we are today, twenty twenty one, where we were a year ago, um, imagine if what had happened in the last twelve months had happened five years ago. For most of you know most organizations i mean as it was there were organizations racing around like like um, headless chickens trying to get kits and laptops to their people and everything at lockdown but um at least many organizations had already moved over to cloud-based technology had already facilitated remote and flexible working for their people but it, yeah can you imagine what that would have been like if this if what we're dealing with now had been five years ago or ten years ago um, it would have been an absolute nightmare. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, to, to answer your question, it can only continue to contribute to, to making great employee experiences, but only coming back to my first point, if we, if we don't think of it as a silver bullet, if we just think of it as another tool that we need to be using to help make our workplaces great places to be for our people, wherever those workplaces are whether they're in some kind of shared office situation, whether they're down the end of the corridor, whether they're at the kitchen table, it doesn't matter. We've got to, we've got to be really clear about trying to create replicable cultures wherever people are interacting, us, interacting with our organisations as employers. Um, because it's exactly like, it, it, my, my key point is always that we should be treating employers like we treat customers. And what I mean by that is that we deliver a consistent experience of our brands or a consistent experience of our organization, a consistent experience of our culture. And that takes care, it takes curating, it takes crafting. And, uh, and that's where the skill will lie. And the tech's just a tool, it's only ever a tool. Um, Joe, do you have any examples of organizations that really improved their employee experience and raised engagement levels um, by incorporating digital tools? 
I do, I do. Um, interestingly enough, it was it was a, a client we worked with some years ago, actually, or few, some years, a few years ago, um, an automotive manufacturer, and they were launching a new luxury brand, in, and, the, and they were a mainstream brand. And it was really important that they wanted to uh, make sure that their retailer staff around their national networks delivered a customer experience that was a cut above what would normally be considered to be the sort of the more mainstream customer experience, if you like. Um, and they what, what you what you need to understand is that it, it, in at that time there were there were no platforms in this particular organization, no kind of ways of collaborating or connecting um, in any kind of digital way. And the traditional way that manufacturers, automotive manufacturers connected with their retailer people was through the annual conferences or quarterly conferences or training events in massive great you know academy um buildings and so on and that was the traditional way and pu pushing out communication through through email um and so we used a an online platform a, a social enterprise network um to engage these retail staff um but made them feel special we created a real community around this new brand um, that gave the re retailer staff um, forward information advanced information we shared um, stuff with them that they wouldn't otherwise have, have have had and made them feel special we exposed the leadership team to them you know there was real one-to-one -one, um, conversations by from the leadership team to uh, the the the, the um, retailer staff through this platform and and the, the thing that I always remember was the when they did finally get together for a phys their first physical training program what you would normally have got was that it would have taken the at least half a day or maybe even all of the first day for, for the for things to warm up a bit you know for people to sort of settle um, and the what we saw was that they literally hit the ground running you know, before they'd even got into the academy to start their training programme because they'd had a few weeks of all interacting over this platform, chatting, banter, you know, all of that kind of stuff virtually. When they actually did meet, it was like they'd known each other forever um, and there was no kind of having to slowly build it up. So significant change, total, total culture change to what had normally been the you know the normal way that those sorts of things were done and and ultimately what was the objective of all of that the objective of that was to give the consumer a, a, a customer experience that was better than a normal mainstream brand would give job done because they were all so passionate about the brand and they were enthused by the brand and they wanted to be a part of it and were proud to be a part of it because they've been invested in um, and were made to feel valued and important that's brilliant. It could be maybe easier for some people to sort of break the ice digitally before doing it in person because it can take a little bit longer for people to, to warm up face to face sometimes. But with, if they'd already had that introduction to each other through Absolutely. the digital platform, then they were already they already knew each other. Mm. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That. Um, so I'm just going to ask one last question before we open it up to questions from um, the attendees here. And I'm just going to ask this question to everyone. I'll just go around you all one more time. Um, so the final question is, um, what is one best practice or improvement um, you would suggest for any organization looking to um, digitally transform their employee experience? So Carmel, I'll come back to you on this one because I kind of, sorry I left you a bit there for a wee while. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, Roshi. Um, okay, so I think um, to um, to actually start to focus on on um, employee experience, I think we have to look at the full um, you know employee life cycle, everything from our first interaction with the organisation at hiring, right through to when we retire somebody at the end of um, of their, their their career and their their service with an organisation. And, you know, I said before, I think that, you know, HR needs to become a little bit more strategic and not to put, I suppose, all of this, the onus of all of this onto HR, because I think that employee experience, it spans multiple departments in any organization. So it's how we interact with the technology in the organization, how we get paid, how we, um, you know, what the physical work environment is. So I think it's a leadership requirement that you know every part of the leadership team is engaged in that experience and we have to look at it um, as joe said it very much has to be looked at from a customer experience so what is that customer experience for our um for our employees but i do think that hr need to lead 
that strategic movement, but it does require the other leaders within the business to engage in actually making the employee experience um, better across organizations. And it is becoming more challenging with multiple generations in the workforce and this requirement to continuously learn um, and new technologies coming at us. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's the challenge ahead. Thank you. And yourself, Rich, what is one best practice or improvement that you would suggest for any organization looking to digitally transform their employee experience? To answer that, I could give you a story about uh, a sports team we were working with. We were doing a customer service session for their ticket office. And each week I'd come in, I was conducting the sessions, and each week I'd come in and they'd say, oh, the fans are killing us because they'll come in with the ticket policy and they'll say, you know, no, it says each, not every. So I, I listened to this a couple of weeks in a row and I said, great, let's do something about it. So I printed out their ticket return policy. And I gave it to each one of them, put them in groups, said change it, correct words that, that don't work. And I collected them all, gave it to the director of ticket operations, who then turned it over to legal, and they made changes. The takeaway here is listen to your, listen to your audience. If you want to transform your digital experience, go to the people who are experiencing it and ask them what's going to work here. In this last session, what did work, what didn't work? What can we do better next time? Those are the people you should be asking. And Jason, yourself, um, your, your one best practice or improvement that you would suggest for an organization looking to transform their employee experience? Yeah, very, very similar to the one just gone, just been stolen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, organizations, you know, the, the ELTs need to have digital employee experience first on the agenda. Um, it does, as, as we've already said, take time, it takes design, there needs to be a lot of thought, and that will involve including everybody within the organisation in those discussions. But overall, when, if you do that, what you get is um, you, you encourage a united environment so that every staff member feels empowered to, to engage with the enterprise at large, and that can only be a good thing. And yourself, Joe? Um, well, actually, one of the guys in the chat box has nicked mine which um so i'm gonna to have to give credit to uh anthony doherty i think it was i jotted his name down he said practice what you preach because because what i was going to say was when you're talking about something like a, a, an online comms platform an engagement platform or a collaboration platform from a best practice point of view get your leadership team to be visible on there get them to be seen to be embracing the channels and the technology, because what that does is it gives permission to everybody else, um, tacit permission um, as, as well as over, you know, um, overt permission. Um, we follow our leaders behaviorally, um, and we need to get so we get our leadership teams on these platforms, visible, taking part, interacting with people. Then, instead of people thinking, "Oh, this is just a sort of nice to have or something I should do occasionally." It is, it, they see it as being a, a permanent part of the communications channel and the way in which people interact. It's giving permission. So thank you, Anthony, you said it for me, practice what you preach. So I'll just ask a few questions that were um, posted in here by some of the attendees. And the first one I will ask is, can we encourage engagement with employees through awards and recognition? Is that enough or should we offer more upskilling? So does anyone want to take that? question yeah I, I'll, I'll take that Roisin um, yep. I, I think it's um, I think it's a range of things I think not every person in the organization is going to be driven by um, you know the, the, the same thing so bonuses and awards we are sure work fine for some people for other people it's more about the job that they're doing and I suppose the the satisfaction they get from that, the, the feeling of you know having purpose from that. So I think you kind of need to to ask, um, you know, as Rich said, I think you kind of need to ask and understand what it is makes that difference for employees. And I and I think a lot of research that comes out is that a lot of the top things really are around the job that that you know that that it is purposeful. Um, and also around things like that I'm getting to learn and to grow. Uh, and for other people, it may be just depending where they are in their life stage, it may be around, um, you know, the facility, you know, 
you know, the, the, the games, the whatever um, the organization provides. So um, I, I think it's a multitude of things and you have to gauge the, the temperature of your audience and understand what, what motivates them. Can I just add to that? Because I think that's a really very good point Carmel's made and it's about treating people as individuals. But at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or um, if we're talking about um, recognition. Um, you can recognise somebody by giving them access to training and development and the opportunity maybe to learn a new skill. So there's that lovely that lovely thing that Dan Pink talks about with autonomy, mastery and purpose. And we've had some quite interesting work we've done with clients where we've actually said, look, the, the reward or the, 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 the reward that you get in return for something can be your choice. You can. I've always wanted to learn how to do pottery. Great. Off you go. Go and you know, we'll make that possible for you. Or I've always wanted to travel to the Seychelles and learn about the whatever, whatever giant tortoises you know oh, great that's what you're going to do so it that's still learning that's still development and if you then come back and you share those learnings with your colleagues and you you um you know you sort of expand upon what you've what you've learned to actually grow other people as well think creatively about these things they don't have to be siloed it, it doesn't have to be one thing or the other on either or and I suppose that comes back again to what Rich said about knowing your audience, because rewards and recognition, one thing could mean something to to me and it could a reward or recognition could mean could like uh, engage you in a completely different way. So it really depends on on your knowing your audience and like what kind of stage your employees are at and what means what to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question that we have here as well is I can see one. While organizations have been able to carry on inducting new employees in a virtual world with some difficulty. Um, I wonder actually, is this, yeah, this, sorry, I just got confused. I thought it was one from a different session there. While organizations have been able to carry on inducting new employees in a virtual world with some difficulty, one of the most important experiences for a new employee to gain a real understanding of the company culture, structure, etc are the informal formal water cooler chats with new colleagues that we've all once experienced. Can companies replicate this in a virtual context? And if so, how? Yeah, yes. I'd like to touch that. I'll go yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, in the previous session, someone had brought up an idea like this, and I use the term the virtual parking lot, mm -hmm. which is a, a term that I picked up along the way. And it's just the, let's open up early, let's stay late, and allow people to have informal discussions because that's where company culture will also reveal itself, certainly in the formal uh, routine of work. But beyond that, what our values are, are expressed in sessions and then in, in uh, pardon me, in post-session discussions, in informal meetings. And, and that's also where we find out what motivates people. So we can point blank ask as a leader, what motivates you and how can I best meet your needs and, and get the best out of you. I can also find that out through discussion. So it's it's a, a, a two way street there. It's, it's definitely during work and it's after work as well. I was just gonna say also, um, one of the discussions I was having with the client, we, we talked about the very beginning of the recruitment process and, and that instead of having job postings, have turn them into stories and then involve people in those stories so some narrative from people that are already in the organization so that right from the very beginning before they've even got to interview stage they've had some level of interaction with people in the organization and then continue that through the recruitment process all the way through to their induction and onboarding um, and that's that's a way of digitally being able to give them a little bit more uh, atmosphere I, I was just going to say, and, and again, I, I seem to be getting all my all my input from your from your amazing chat box. You've got, you've got some great delegates on this uh, on this conference this afternoon. Um, but I was just going to actually describe what Vicky Johnson in, in the chat has just des described, um, where she she mentions how um, one of the companies where she worked booked virtual coffee sessions where people could choose to participate and just got picked randomly to connect with somebody. And I've heard that being done over and over again in the last 12 months, be using technology to just sort of set up blind dates almost, you know, um, with people. Um, and and it's the it's the absolute um, you know, exact replica of the of the water 
school a moment where you happen to find yourself standing next to somebody while you're waiting to get your drink and um and it, and it's a great way to sort of create that uh, that dynamic so thank thank you very much for for that one vicky <laughs> So I'll ask one last very quick question here. Um, we just have a few minutes left to answer this one. So from employ from employee engagement perspective, um, working in a few different industries in the past, what advice would you have on helping on what is in it for the employee? Why should I interact, engage with peers, management? Is there any advice from the panel on how to improve de deployment for employee perspective? <laughs> I, I think I, mean, I think that's a really quite a sad question actually um and I don't mean that from the person who's posed it um I think that if we are work if we are in a position where we're asking that question then an awful lot of stuff has already been going wrong to get to that point uh, actually um and um there, there's an awful lot more stuff that needs to be done rather than why should I interact with some kind of platform or why should I interact with some digital transformation? You actually need to be going back much further than that and saying, why is why have I got a workforce where this where this becomes a question? Um, you know, we should have people managers and team leaders who are doing their work effectively and engaging with their people in such a way that their teams want to engage with them. And that has a knock on effect to leaders. Leaders need to be talking in an authentic and open voice with humanity to their people so that their people want to hear from them and want to respond. So there's a there's a lot underneath that question, which I think is more, more fundamental than simply a, a trite, oh, this is what we need to do with digital transformation. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, that's pretty much all we have time for today. So thanks everyone for coming on and answering all of my questions. It was a really great um, talk and thanks for being part of this event again, especially Joe and Jason coming back to do another one with us. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Sorry about my problems earlier. Oh, don't worry. We got you in the end. It's fine. I'm glad you're Thank here. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Russian, I better bring my microphone down so you can hear me. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, all, all of your participation and the audience as well. It's great to see all those uh, being able to respond to some of the comments going on in there. So um, we'll finish up there and I'll let you all go. Please stick around and uh, for our final session today and uh, I'll put you back out into the audience now. But thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And thanks, Rushing. Goodbye. All righty then. Uh, a fantastic session. Another one uh, down, and it was wonderful, of course. We have one more uh, to go this afternoon. Um, so I'll head away now and prepare for that, and we will be uh, scheduled to start that in about another five minutes. So uh, get yourself a cup of tea and see you back here shortly. Thank you.
Okay, I'll get my next speakers ready. First of all, I'll bring uh, Joe Horton on. Joe, just look out for a prompt to come onto screen. I also have Nick as well. I'll bring you up onto the screen as well. Uh, Ramesh. Yep, Ramesh, you're there. I'll just invite you onto the screen as well. made it <laughs> hello joe how are you doing yes, thanks all good uh, we've got ramesh as well how are you doing i'll just get the others hi, hi, good. Up hi. here um just some people asking if it will be um recorded um where can i get the link it'll be the same place that you came here and the recording will be um be here as well uh i just have Brian as well. Unfortunately, Lisa can't make it today due to um, some family uh, issues. So our thoughts with Lisa. Oh, okay. Uh, Brian. Hi, Joe. It's hey. good to see you. Hey, Ramesh. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. I've, uh, <laughs> I've been watching the last couple of sessions just to get a feel for how it all worked. So, uh, yeah, it's been been some really interesting discussions. <laughs> <laughs> Our robot is called Joe. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, Nick, I've just invited you on as well. That's right. I was there. having a look on the website <laughs> earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, dear. I'll just wait for uh, both Brian and Nick to get connected. <clears throat> no problem. Give them a few seconds. We're on schedule, so that's all good. Um, yeah. Thanks to everybody in the audience for your participation. Um, I did miss one question there. I see it was asking about CARM or what system they had used. I believe it was an an IBM system. It was learning. The they called it learning, didn't they, Chris? I think. Yeah. Are uh, your your something? Your learn learn. Yeah, it's it's further up in the chat. I think um, somebody somebody answered it as well in the chat. Yeah. 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 Okay. It was an IBM one, I believe. I'll yeah. close that question down. Sandra had that question. We'll see if we can find that for you. That looks like Nick's on. Hi everyone. Hey, Nick. <laughs> Nick, how hey. are you? So I'm good. Sorry, I was. I've, I've, we're, we're in the middle of lambing season, so it's. Uh, I've had a quick dash of something. <laughs> That's fair enough then. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Uh, I'm still just waiting for Brian to get connected. So, um, are you having any issues there, Brian? Let me know in the chat. Um, we might. Um, We'll get you on no matter what. Before we had Joe Moffat couldn't get connected. The phone was quite a good picture and sound anyway. So there's always a way. Um, so what I might do, I might just work with Brian to get him connected, but we'll get uh, underway and I will uh, introduce you, Joe, and we'll go from there. No worries. So our final panel for the day, it's been a huge day. It's, uh, it's gone really quickly, actually. Um, and we're into using technology to optimize a deskless and distributed workforce. <clears throat> and I'm thrilled that um, Joe Horton has offered to moderate the session. Um, Joe is the Assistant Professor of Project Management at UCD Michael Smurfett uh, Graduate Business School. He has an extensive background in software development, has worked with uh, multinational organizations such as General Electric. He has a huge wealth of uh, knowledge and experience, and I'm uh, really delighted for you to be moderating the session. Thanks, Joe. Um, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I will um, be here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. I'll, I will come off um, screen and I'll go and see if I can help Brian. Oh, it looks okay. like he doesn't. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Just, just uh, exactly at the point when you asked to join up, everything decided to go. 
<laughs> it's been working perfectly all day and just went <laughs> boom. So here we are. It's always the way. Always the way. Hey, I'll I'll uh, let you take over now, Joe, and I won't be far away if you need me for anything at all. No worries, Chris. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, I've, I've thrown thrown the kids off roadblocks, so uh, so hopefully my my internet connection is gonna 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 hold up today as well. Um, yeah, welcome to the session, everybody. Um, using technology to optimize a deskless and distributed workforce. Yeah, I, I remember reading that when first Chris sent it to me a week or two ago, and I thought that's a scary question, isn't it? It kind of, you know, it sounds like we're all going to be turned into robots and optimized, and uh, and and end up in in some kind of, you know, kind of sci-fi world. So, um, so yeah, what we're going to talk about today is 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 exactly that, and we've got we've got some really interesting experience in the room. Um, I'm not going to introduce each person. I'll let them introduce themselves because I think they, they will introduce themselves far better than I can. Um, my background going back to um, the kind of late 80s, early 90s was distributed databases for Salesforce systems. Um, so writing those kind of databases, writing the comms packages and stuff. And I did that for about 20 years um, working with global um sales teams. Um, so I kind of been in this distributed space for a long time. Uh, and then I moved into a portfolio role with with teaching at university and, and management consulting. But even even in, in, you know, more recent years, a lot of distributed coaching, um, coaching over Skype and, you know, latterly Zoom, this kind of stuff. Um, so I think stories about how we've leveraged technology, to help remote working and not just in the last 12 months but perhaps over you know the last number of years pre-covid even uh, would be would be really good and i think sharing sharing some stories you know that, that people can take and say how can i apply this into the current situation that i'm facing would be would be great i think um i think ladies first um let's let's <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so so let's let's go over to nick um nick i, I mean th i had a look up bob health and it looks absolutely fascinating tell us about this 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 um this information sharing portal yeah so so we, we started bob health basically as a place where nhs staff can go in a safe space where they can discuss the projects that they're working on whether they're large or small and they can write up their experiences in, in the form of an impact story so basically they they write up all that practical how-to elements of what made the project happen all the yeah. stumbling they faced um and add attachments about all sort of like um uh, case studies and publications and anything that might be useful that goes along with it things down to even like flow charts that might need to be going into fridges for new medicine lines for instance um mm -hmm. and the idea is that that place can then ha have act as a hub for that information so other NHS staff around the country can uh, develop, adapt it and scale it. Um, so we just want to offer that service for our NHS staff and um, it's it's free. Uh, it's really important for us to keep it that way and yeah. um, it's and I'm really passionate about it. I spent a lot of time working in the NHS and the last one of my jobs was focused around getting that experience out there to um, staff and um, being a bit more engaging and it's really difficult often things sit in silos so it's really important for that information to be out there for people to access that need to access it and to be able to do that for free so that's that's right. the remit of fantastic and how long has bob been going and i mean how are you are you are you getting penetration into the nhs i mean the nhs is a big organization isn't it i mean how many thousand people work in the nhs yeah. i think it's i think it's i think it's nearly 10 million there's there's, there's loads and loads of people it's you know the biggest employer in in the uk it's 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 difficult for people to to work and communicate for those reasons obviously yeah. There's similarities, but every every site is different to another site. Uh, we've got different demographics for patients and for our staff. So it's it's important for us to have resources available for people to be able to learn from, develop and share so that they that they can learn from them and they don't get lost. Often things do get lost when people when people leave roles. Uh, they sit on what, what are called the S drives within NHSs. Uh, and when they go, that, that information's gone. So it's it's about put, putting that system in place and making it somewhere that's people can go to as a hub. Um, so far, we've had, we've had quite a lot of really good uh, positive feedback. We've had lots of use. Uh, we've got good conversations going off with NHS organisations, be that hospital trusts and GP federations. Uh, some things called academic health science networks, um, and all sorts of things like that. So it's it's going really well. It's uh, we've been live about a year now, uh, maybe just under. Um, but our main module launched in December, um, which 
is what we call the writing engine. So we aim to make answers quite concise for our, our writers. Uh, we have a hundred word counts limit for people um, to be able to input, input their information and do it in a thoughtful manner. Um, and it all reads out like a story, basically. So it's, it's trying to make it a really nice, engaging experience for our users. Really? Fantastic. So very much people connecting with people and t sharing their stories so that you can then empower people to to, to, to do better, which is exactly. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Which is which seems to be completely the opposite end of the spectrum, Ramesh. <laughs> <laughs> to 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 um, I, uh, Civitra is that is that the company? How do you pronounce Civitra. that? Civitra. Civitra. Yeah. So so introduce yourself and tell us what what your company does and and how your Joe um, it kind of works. Yeah. yeah. So thanks thanks Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our um, you know robot is called Joe, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, you know you. When you started your introduction, you alluded a lot into, you know, the technologies that you worked in in the in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, yeah. probably on distributed workforce or distributed technologies. Uh, you know, the, the the reality is, Joe, that today uh, a lot of organizations, or rather every organization, you know, will have people um, working on different technologies you know some of it very old but still yes. very very important for the business some of it very new and shiny <laughs> you know all the modern <laughs> cloud-based apps and things like that which are also good but yeah what we find is that a significant amount of time uh, is spent by employees actually just toggling between technologies you know people um, do a lot of data entry, repeat work, you know, yeah. reconciling two systems in their day to day jobs, which, to be honest, leaves very, um, you know, takes away a significant portion of their productive time. So mm. people behave like a robot for 30 percent of their daily or 30 or 40 percent on an average every day. Now, what we do as a company is to help organizations move away from that. So you can let a robot be a robot. So all the boring, repetitive stuff, leave it to a robot so that you can focus on more productive, more creative tasks. So as a company, what Civita does is we enable organizations to adopt software workers or digital workers, as we call them, yeah. to work alongside the human counterpart so that all the boring stuff can be taken care of by the software robots and the humans can be more productive in what they do best, you know, creative thought and creative judgment and do things which are needed for the art. So that's that's what Servita does. So we've been, uh, you know, we've been around since 2018. We are a young company, but technology of this nature has been there for a while. Um, you know, there's a lots of, uh, you know, brilliant technology. The technology is called robotic process automation. Uh, there's, so it's a combination of RPA and artificial intelligence. But the problem has been that it's been marred by a lot of hype. <laughs> you know, people talk about it as it's something far out there which nobody can touch. And it's been too expensive for small to medium firms. What Servitor's done is turned it on, is turned it on its head where you can be a startup with two people <laughs> and you can adopt this technology or you can be a multi-billion firm it doesn't matter wow. with the same yeah, amount on of the website you've got you've got like um solicitors offices and stuff so i mean give us yes. a give us a use case of a small business because i mean probably a, quite a number of the people on the call uh, are involved with you know smes or small businesses so yeah. give us a use case for something like this and how would it how would it help both the employees because we're talking about optimizing the workforce aren't we yeah. as well as the company sure super so let me take a you know very simple use case actually we have one in the finance function you know we have uh, one of our um, you know one of our um, uh, customers actually using technology of this nature to do a lot of their internal processing in their finance system so what happens is they deal with a lot of their end clients who send yeah. them details for which you know they have to collect all the details enter it into their uh, central system and create an invoice which is then yeah. sent back to them for uh, processing now yeah. It's a simple task. The data comes in a standard format in email. Somebody has to take that, enter it into a system, create an invoice, 
once that invoice is created, it has to be formatted, then it has to be emailed back. So right from the point where the data comes in, the software robot will identify all those elements, take it, key it into a system, produce an output, format it, and email it back. So the entire life cycle is taken care by the robot. The, beaut the beauty of this technology, though, is that you know, it's not some back-end integration or it's not something that's you know behind the scenes. It's exactly what a human worker would do. So what would you as a human worker do? You would you know access a set of emails, take some data, but put it into an Excel sheet, take that Excel sheet, enter it into a system, produce an output. Once that output is produced, email it back. The robot would exactly do these same steps uh, you know, on screen. So it's uh, it's it's it, it's it seems quite uh, you know fast and uh, smooth, but it is in reality it is exactly that. So you, it's it's replicating the keystrokes of what a human would do, and it's it's pretty fast to incorporate something like this. Cool. Great. Okay. Well, that's 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 absolutely fascinating. I mean, I'd I'd love to see that in action. Brian, you've been you've been an IT specialist for for years. You're you you're a, a mobile IT specialist, I think, aren't you? For I three is it the regional college? So you've been in well, this space for a while. What's what? What are your thoughts on what you've heard so far? Yeah. Well, I I do you know what that Stevitor uh, product exactly exactly fits the mantra that I normally give out to most businesses, which is that the computer should work for you, not the other way around. Although it's a good idea if you know how to work it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you've got to you've got to be able to feed it and actually, you know, but when you've fed it the right thing, it should go ahead and do its thing instead of leaving you to do boring mundane stuff and that's a, a fight I've been fighting for many years. You're right, I've been in the business for a very long time possibly roughly the same vintage as yourself joe you might be just a tad ahead of me i wouldn't i wouldn't be <laughs> i wouldn't like to speculate but um i i've been in the education space now for for uh, a good many years previous to that i've been in in private companies doing all sorts of stuff i actually was hoping to talk to lisa because i'm also a, a certified ethical hacker and use that in my day-to-day -day work too so I, mm. I get around quite a lot of the, the different things including pretty much anything IT related. So what I actually do at the minute is I work for Southern Regional College as an IT specialist, working with small businesses, small and medium enterprises, and helping them to do things that are interesting with technology and useful. And I, I, the other stop line I normally have is I help people spend government money in interesting ways. Um, a wonderful job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know, if it wasn't, and, and going back to the Civitor thing, if it wasn't for all the paperwork, it would be a brilliant, brilliant job. Uh, yeah. But there's quite a lot of paperwork involved. Having said that, that isn't that huge. So, yeah, it's a really good job, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, um, my background, as I said, is, is cross the gamut. At the minute, I have projects involving computer animation, uh, office automation, um, actual automation, using uh, IoT, doing all sorts of stuff. I, I just basically get involved in whatever I can get my hands on, mm. and uh, and that's where I am. Um, I, I I unfortunately for for Nick there, um, Bob always brings back memories of, of Microsoft Bob, which kind of was trying to do what Civitor does. Uh, but I've heard of that Bob project before, and I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant concept. The idea of being able to put information out there that would be relatively anonymous and everybody could share, and I think that's just amazing. Um, yeah. And what I would be trying to do with a lot of the companies that I work with is to actually bring your kinds of technology to them in a, in a very simplified way and then direct them to people like yourselves to actually do the proper job mm. and that's that's kind of what we do fantastic um, so you're very much a connector as well as an enabler of the technology absolutely yeah, yeah. We, we 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 lead people sometimes kicking and screaming into this this technology and using it to help their their business and bringing them to things that they would never have considered or just couldn't do right I mean, we can't we can't ignore the elephant in the room, the COVID kind of, you know, last, the past year. Um, I'm sitting at my kitchen table, as you can see. <laughs> um, you know, please be quiet in the next room. April came in and started making a pancake just now. Um, <laughs> it's Pancake Tuesday, I forgot. Absolutely, that's right. It's just maybe not right now. Um, but have we, you know, are we able at the at the moment to optimize the remote workforce? Or is it just a matter of 
making do and helping everybody get through the next six months while until they get the jabs and we get back to the office what's what's what are your thoughts around that we'll come back come back to to nick first on this one um I think it's it's a tricky one. That from an NH, I'll answer from an NHS staff perspective. Well, yes, because will... you aren't at home, all of you are you. You're you're frontline workers, and you've been there in the thick of it. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 enabled technology to be rapidly uptaken in the NHS. The last six sort of like what was it now a year basically, yeah. um, uh, and certainly in the last eight to ten months, there's a lot of work that people have been able to do to transform the ways that people can have video consultations that they can you know interact with their patients but also that they can interact as teams so that quality improvement work can still go on and service transformation can still happen because other services are still needed to be running um and it's it's often you know there's until until recently people in there just didn't didn't walk around with a laptop and you had two on a ward and you'd, you'd fight over, over over who would be able to put access patients records first yeah. in the morning so you get there and have your cup of tea there so you were uh, you didn't have to be the last person like um mm. so it's an interesting time because everybody has, from, from, from what I've, I've heard and from all the people I'm having chats with about all the work that's going on, has embraced the technology and, and being able to uh, improve their workforce. Um, and it, from a staff perspective, it's, it's meant that they're able to, to keep in touch with patients. Uh, yeah. So a really quite a nice example of that would be um, we've got a cardiac rehab um, rehabilitation service story up on the, on the site, and that's basically work to ensure that patients that probably needed to go in and see see their consul consultants or physiologists um could remain active uh, during during lockdown without having to go in so they were able to do uh online exercise classes they're able to still talk to the staff they wow. they, ad they addressed yeah they, and they found issues so they found issues with um with the pharmacy department um being able to with patients not knowing whether they could get in touch with them how to get in touch so they fixed fix things in the chain of command for their patients um and it you know it's so it's there's, there's lots of things that have been done really really well and it's it's for us as as bob health it's it's capturing that now um and and making sure that it's not lost because there's a lot of learning that's been done so rapidly a lot of things that have been brought in and there's so many things that people can learn from from multidisciplinary teams so you've done a video consultation copd that's great that's useful for a service in cardiac um for them to be able to see how you've ran that, how you put that information together for patients, how you ran teams, how you how you managed all breakout rooms and all that kind of stuff that's quite tricky. Um, what staff were key to get things to go through, how you address putting a business case together during these times and discuss with the chief execs. That's something that people want to know and they need to know. So they need to know the how of all, all of the things that are being put out there. So there's real room for it to be done now, but I think there's also got to be a real appreciation for how busy and how hard People are working in the in the, in the primary, secondary CCGs everywhere within the NHS right now, and all the suppliers that are supporting those um, those those staff as well. So that everyone's really really busy. So yeah. it's doing in a time time frame that manages and works for staff well. Um, I think sadly our NHS staff are, are uh, primed to work to pressures anyway with winter beds. Um, so often working at pace is something that it's just second nature. It's just something that people do. Um, but it's less done to sit back, think about what's what you've actually done and go, actually, that's something that other people around the country could benefit from. Um, mm. so that's, that's where we're trying to uh, almost have a behavioural change and an impact on the culture of how people address uh, learning from one another, basically. So right now yeah. is an interesting time is all that I can really, really say on that one. OK. I mean, coming coming maybe to Brian then, because, you know, Brian, you're working with lots of different small companies and, and you know, maybe medium sized and large companies as well. And you seem to have got a lot of experience in a lot of different types of technology implementation and technology use. And it's kind of a bit like Nick was saying, you, it's kind of like there's so much information there. How do you best apply it to the right places? And, you know, I, I guess you've got like, you know, 20, 30 years of experience, perhaps in all these different uses of tech. How, how, how do you find kind of the crossover? Do you, do you find that you can take things from one client or from one engagement and, you know, amplify the use of it in, for, for another client, that kind of stuff? Well, it's a very good point, and and literally, I was having that exact conversation with a client just yesterday, and, and right. saying, they were they were saying, uh, I need to do this. And I said, Oh, funny enough, I'm just working on that with someone else. That'll be very good. We can just bring it across. 
clearly occasionally there's patents pending and stuff and and client confidentiality yes. etc you, you can't just do it willy-nilly but at the same time it, it it's very cross-pollinating um mm. people will come up with different problems and say oh i need to do this i need to do that and you you come up with answers for them and then you go wait a minute i can apply that elsewhere and my kind of again my ethos in this sort of thing is that you know nothing is ever thrown away I think the beauty now of having been forced to, I, I, for the first time, been in this space for a very long time, been in IT for a long time, I actually had to put something up on YouTube. And um, I was literally kicking and screaming into that that particular thing. It's now there, people can reuse it and I don't then have to do it again, which is actually kind of a, oh, that's not a bad idea. Hmm. So I, I think from our perspective, uh, the, the ability to, to to do something once and do it really, really well, make an exemplar of it, and then have that as a template for others to work from is extremely valuable. And mm. it, it, given that I work across lots of different companies, they've all got different requirements and they're different sizes, they're different places, it's surprising how common some of the, 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 the requirements are and the things they need to do, um, yeah. and, and even the technologies they use. And that's got to lead us straight over to Roger, Ramesh, because, I mean, presumably that's what Joe does, is it? Kind of learns from use cases in different similar scenarios and then builds up a, an intelligent kind of way of applying that. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, point because, like Brian said, uh, you know, you see similarities in um, a lot of, you know, use cases in, in businesses. But... The, the interesting aspect of automation is um, that's probably the biggest reason why automation fails. <laughs> in automation. Great. So expand on that. Yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> point. Yeah. Because the, the, the reality is in, in many cases, the business process is very, very similar. Let's take accounts payable. It's a, yeah. it's a task. Everybody it's a has that. Task. Yeah. Everybody has that, right? You get an invoice from a supplier, you see what it is, you enter it in the ERP system, you go through some matching and you pay it out. But two different organizations with exactly the same systems will have slight variations in the way they actually handle it. Yes. You know, and those minor variations are what defines that organization. I mean, I'm taking a very, you know, simplistic process. So the, the success in being able to automate something of that nature is the, the, the success is actually making sure that your process the way you map it and the way you actually automate it is exactly mapping what that organization requires right yeah when you do that across two or three or four different organizations what you will find is that yes there are certain things conceptually which is the same so you can probably get faster to, you know, getting to the end point because, you know, conceptually, this is how it works. Uh, you know, these are the, uh, these are the stumbling blocks you will have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are the typical uh, kind of exceptions or, you know, these are the typical uh, problems that you will face in, in a process like this. But the actual automation bit of it using a robot has to be very, very specific to that organization. Okay, and so it it's is, kind of semi-bespoke, you know, but you've got, to, you've got to have the bespoke bit in. It's, 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 absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And when you try to paint it with a brush that it's exactly the same, and that's where you know a lot of automation, people think, okay, it's going to be exactly the same. You will find that the very next day of doing deploying something, um, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, when you're automating something, you're, you're actually mapping what a user is doing on the screen. Right? right. Just to give a simple uh, an example, you might have a system upgrade, right? And yeah, an element changes. Of, yeah. <laughs> something will change in the system and your automation doesn't work. So it's it's about constantly evolving that process to make sure that your digital worker can keep pace with what a human worker, because human workers are very intuitive. They, yes. you know, they see a different change. Hey, this doesn't look right. I'm going to do something here. A robot yeah. is not that intuitive. <laughs> right? it's, yeah. uh, rather, it's not intuitive at all. <laughs> so you're yeah. going to make sure that the robot identifies that and is able to keep pace with that through a change. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So coming back to coming back to, to Nick and your 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 plethora of user stories that are building up in this amazing database of yours. Uh, can, can you maybe you know give us an example of 
of of one where you know somebody's posted something that they've they've done that's that's helped a ward or that's you know enabled a nurse or you know a kind of personal story that that people can relate to if you like um in in terms of optimizing or or making somebody's job better or easier so uh what one of my personal favorites this and it's, it's personal favorite because i would have found it so useful when i was on a ward was um one from um a not-for-profit that's that started up called card medic run by dr rachel grimaldi and she's uh, she was working away and she felt like she she wanted to do something to help her staff. So she was in America. She couldn't get back during right. COVID to help her release these friends um, and support them during COVID. So she came up with this idea of digital flashcards that could be used on iPads, iPhones, whatsoever. Um, and on those things, there's information that staff can give to patients or staff can interact with each other when they're wearing full PPE. To so say basic things like, I'm going to give you some pain relief. Are you in pain? And it just it helps that interaction and keep that human rapport with a patient and i say i would have used that uh, i would use that when i'm going to work in infectious diseases or i would have found it really really useful for patients where there was a language barrier uh, yes. to help me have that that rapport with a patient um and i just found it fantastic so i got in touch with her and i got um, an impact story written up uh, for what she was doing and and now she's she's cascading out so she's cascaded out between some hospitals the one where she works some extra hospitals we're following along and we're going to do an impact story for uh, all those sites on how they've uh, how, how they've run it to see because uh, as we say no, nothing's the same wherever people are there are slight nuances with how people will use everything and there's different learnings that can be can be had from how they implemented it or how they use it um so it was really interesting to do um, and we followed it through with another one that was based around um how you can keep those how, how you need to keep ipads clean how you can make sure that infectious infectious disease protocols are, are kept in play during this time how you can utilize and upkeep this how you can get this put through um to be used on on boards in a and e's and all sorts of different settings where there's slightly different ways yeah. of working how you can train stuff when they're so busy um it's 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 for me it's uh, such it's my favorite one because of because of how useful i, I feel it is for patients right now and yeah. for us because as a and staff it plays member, beautifully it plays beautifully into the kind of protocol based um kind of approach doesn't it and i mean i can imagine that once you've got that protocol set of flashcards or whatever you can just choose the right one but i mean wouldn't it be easy then to just translate that into all the languages that are in use through the nhs for all the patients and all the different nurses and stuff and now really? you've you've amplified the the capability of that that set of cards yeah so she's definitely she's i know she's i know that's something that's being worked on right now um and it's been worked on so she, she doesn't just work solo she has people from different professions to input different information um yeah. so it's all relevant and up to date so i know there's some really good speech and language therapists uh working with her at the moment and it's um i, I feel like I, I like tech that works um <laughs> <laughs> often things get put through and then people don't get trained how to use it properly and yeah. they they don't interact well with it for that reason and you know like i say the technology needs to work for you and i feel like that's a very good example of how how it does and how bob helps you know, people be able to go onto that site go, go on to read the story they can then understand entirely what car medic is all about they can yeah. they can know how how, the, how they need to use the protocols how they can approach uh, their chief exec to put it through for, uh, for you know a rapid pace uh, how they manage to cascade and train staff in such a busy time, all that kind of stuff that's just really, really, really important. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Fantastic. And Brian, have you is is there a story you could share of a, a company that has that has deployed tech recently in a way that has significantly improved the workers experience or the the staff or the users experience in in a way that was, you know, that that helped them? Um I probably couldn't talk about anything that is has been done just right. because so what, what, maybe something that you're working I've on. Never something I'm working on. Um, mm. I've worked on. It's actually slightly related, very very slightly related to the healthcare scenario. It's actually for dentistry, and also for uh, inventory control. And it's a touchless inventory system, so that okay. um, you don't actually have to. Uh, you you come out from the surgery, you go into the the. the store cupboard for want of a better term uh, you want to pick some stuff up you don't want to actually necessarily um, record what you've just lifted but that's not a good thing so we've now decided that we would need to record what they've taken and 
how do you do that? Well, you could key it into the system, but we've decided, no, we're going to go with something a bit like what you get in the supermarket. You just scan it across a barcode reader, and then it records who you are, what you've lifted, how many you've taken, and who it was for. And then that then feeds into other systems that allow people to know how much stuff was used for a given procedure, when it was used, why are we running out, why are they using yeah. too much, all that kind of analytics, and that's coming next. So we're, we've worked on that for a little while now in terms of, of um, doing the tech, doing it. And one of the things that, remember, we're spending government money, so we have to do this as cheaply as physically possible. Mm. So we're you're looking at using very much, uh, a very cheap consumer tech. There's nothing specialist here using an iPad or a tablet or something like that. And this um, is what, and RFID the, tag based, is it, or something like barcodes. that? Barcodes. Bar just, just Pure barcodes, barcodes, even, even, barcodes even or QR simpler. codes. Yeah. Yep. Barcodes okay. or QR codes. Mm -hmm. uh, barcode for who you are, it's on your tag, and a barcode for the object, barcode for the box of objects. You might have to key how many you've taken, that sort of thing. So it, that's, that's one that. Um, uh, we expect we'll actually improve situation for for the business a lot because at the minute they just no really valid way or no easy way of controlling the stock or inventory, but also it it, it fits into the COVID question and it fits into yeah. the uh, infection control question, and it means that people aren't sh you know swapping stuff around and typing on the keyboard which then has to be cleaned and whatever. The idea mm -hmm. is that be, this is as little touch as physically possible. Um, and I have another similar one with a with a, an artist where we're doing some computer vision work and doing what we call touchless connection. The idea is that you'll be able to physically touch something, but it'll change instantly, and therefore you won't. The next person coming along won't be touching the same thing, but you get a high five in some water. And we haven't made it work yet, but that is the plan. So these are the sorts of things that we're doing. Mm. Um, uh, beyond that, there's there there's a lot of remote work type. Uh, stuff that I've been doing as well and to do with not even video conferencing but enabling people to use um, tablets and things to to go out in the field and and then never have to actually interact with someone else's equipment they do it all on their own equipment and that way they keep again control of the touch and all that kind of stuff so so that's kind of where it is let me ask a slightly provocative question uh -oh. and it, it comes again from the ti this title um, using technology to optimize a deskless and distributed workforce. Does tech really optimize anything or does it just get in the way? And I mean, how do we measure optimize? Um, uh, let's, let's come back to Ramesh. You, you've, yeah, it's, it's your turn, Ramesh. So, <laughs> so optimize. I mean, because that implies, implies measurement and implies improvement and, and, you know, kind of doing things better or faster, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a fascinating question, actually. It, uh, goes back to my first, uh, uh, you know, the first point you were discussing, Joe, where we, uh, there is this concept, uh, you know, called two speed architecture. And, you know, technology can be both helpful, and sometimes it can be, uh, you know, play the total opposite role yeah. where it can be, you know, it can pull you down. Yeah, yeah. Where if you have too much tech, you know, you're spending all your time just keeping the tech in order. Mm. <laughs> and I've been an IT manager. I've been on both sides of that fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what that means for an end business user is that you know you are actually uh, you, you are actually toggling between different things just to you know keep something. I'll, I'll give an example. <laughs> you know, we had uh, you, you take the COVID situation for example. You know, you. Uh, we had a very small, uh, we, a small to medium size, uh, uh, you know, retailer who was our customer who had significant high volumes uh, because of COVID. They, you know, they were on the online space and COVID actually helped them and they, right. their volume shot through the roof, which is a good thing. Hmm. However, they had multiple systems and, you know, people in the back office were struggling because they had to keep everything, you know, orders were coming in one, the, you know, updates were had to be the other, they had to do management reporting on a third. Now, you know, with this kind of a technology map, sometimes, you know, it can bring productivity down because one, you're trying to fulfill a customer requirement, which is they need the product. They don't care what systems you have in the no. background. No. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, customer service is trying manically to keep everything uh, you know, in sync from a system point of view. So we, you know, there's a lot of automation that we have done. Not that our solution is solved all their problems. No, they did a lot of brilliant work themselves. Their employees were super productive. But 
on the back end we had um you know joe the robot <laughs> Actually, <laughs> actually manically working and keeping a lot of the systems in order so you know when the orders were coming in updating you know the uh, the systems the warehouse systems the dashboards etc so relieving the employees of a certain level of stress on the other hand you know we had some other businesses on one of our other customers had a real big they were in the hospitality space and they were really hammered in the first round of lockdown and the second round of lockdown they had a lot of cancellations coming in because they were a service provider and their customer services team actually needed some help in terms of keeping track of cancellations because one you got to respond well enough you know once covid is all over it's going to go back to reality but yeah. if all this is piling up it doesn't you know reflect very well so we've actually automated some processes which take care of cancellations and making sure it's done on time they get feedback on time the business users are notified etc so technology by itself is great when there's a mix and when users have to interact with too much it can actually pull you down but that's where the mix of you know a digital worker and a human worker comes into place where you know you can get digital workers to take care of that you know <laughs> interfacing bits and boring bits and you know you can focus on actually doing what a human does best hmm. <laughs> being productive so yeah it's 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 a uh, topic we can go on but i hope it's given some insight <laughs> yeah i mean i come back to the the point that was made towards the end of the last session by i think it was i think it was joe again wasn't it um, <laughs> the lady who came in late um who, who hadn't joined the call and and you know she made the point that this is all about humans yeah so people and connections and stuff like that i think it's very easy for us to forget isn't it that we can get all, all tied up in the tech but yeah. actually what we're talking about is helping people and i mean particularly i suppose nick you know you in, in healthcare i mean i just stand in awe of anybody who's in healthcare at the moment i mean my 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 brother is a uh, my my brother and um, his his wife uh, are both nurses um and i mean it's just phenomenal what you guys have done and the, the rest of us have no idea <laughs> what you guys have gone through i mean just just has, has tech helped or hindered do you, do you think it's been generally a positive force or is it right now it's it's, it's i'd say it's quintessential it's just uh it's just so important for how things are working and um you know i'm no longer on, on the front line and i uh you know i, I tussled with that during covid and uh but I feel like what what we're doing with Bob is is super useful, so that's 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 good for my brain. Um, but um, but but tech is tech is important right now. We 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 wouldn't we wouldn't be able to operate well. The NHS would be able to operate services um, as they are, and it's I think it's as we go back to the optimal usage. It's it's about making sure we are training, educating our staff well, making sure that services are embedded properly, and that there's learnings and that they're not just lost, and that these services can be expanded post COVID and for other services and th th that it can free up a bit of a bit of time for people to be able to factor, focus on the human factors. And I suppose that's really what we're trying to achieve with an impact story for somebody on Bob. We want somebody to do an authentic story, but we want them to do it comprehensively and well once so that yes. they don't have to keep answering hundreds of questions from people because they've done something well. So again, lots of people getting in touch with them and again, inundated by the same questions. Have, yeah. have somebody that you can go to that's a resource that's a hub where, the, where we can go go and have a look at this and then well, let's have a conversation afterwards on how we can work together um that's useful for them immediately there something that they can embed locally within where they work that they can learn from um and and that can be done nationally and and scaled um when it's adapted or importantly adapted not replicated yeah um but that's also useful to save them time so right now nobody's doing uh, continued professional development or revalidation um it's, it's not something that's that's you know everybody's busy so a lot a lot of organizations and bodies have said we're waiting with COVID um but there'll be a time when people have to start doing revalidation re again and when what that for a, prof a professional that's registered means every year you submit four to five reflective learning pieces um that are really important for your to, for your registration every single year so you pay some money you do all this work and um these this information often often just gets it's it's sat in a silo basically so it's ticked off to say that you've done something but it'd be really really nice if somebody could use use their impact story on bob to do all of their revalidation needs 
I know that they've also got that document yeah. that they can use and embed locally that they can use if they want to do a HSJ award or whatever they whatever purpose they want, basically. So it's it's, it's trying to make sure that that document is useful for the author uh, to save them time, but also for a user. Yeah, I mean it's. It's like knowledge management's come of age, isn't it? We've been talking about this for 20, 30 years, but actually now it's starting to actually work. Um, I mean, e uh, even at my college, um, I'm at University College Dublin, um, <clears throat> there's an amazing professor there called Dr. Linda Yang. Uh, and she started this, um, this thing up about a year ago called the College of Business Intercultural Forum. And it sounds like kind of, you know, people from different parts of the world kind of starting to talk to each other, doesn't it? But, but actually what it morphed into was a community of practice where all the staff who were you know stuck in their offices or stuck at home and, and not being able to talk to each other shared on a weekly basis little tiny nuggets of best practice with each other and what we did and, and it reminded me when brian said he'd kind of he'd, he'd ventured finally into youtube and what we did we, we set up these these half hour webinars with three slots in 10 minute slots okay and right. two or three staff would just share a little best practice around technology or about remote learning or remote teaching or whatever and we just ran one of these every couple of weeks and we, we're still doing it um but it's been incredible how powerful that has been this sharing of information but with a kind of a technology bent um and and it's gone completely college-wide now I mean we started it just as the college of business and then other schools heard about it and said could we join the call could we join the call and it's what you're talking about there uh, Nick about kind of it being scalable as well communities of practice connect the technology connect, connecting people seems to be an underlying kind of thread in, in all this stuff doesn't it and, um um so so Brian have you got any kind of thoughts on that community of practice and and users and sharing yeah, and I think that essentially, uh, well, we've we've started doing um, well weekly is is webinars in a series of various different topics, and we've now put them up on YouTube. That's how I yeah. ended up on YouTube because someone said you will do this. There is no question, <laughs> and no, okay, we've we've started doing that, and and we see that as very valuable. And and the way we've structured them is that you can also be chopped and, and, and reused into different things and exactly yeah. like you're talking about with Bob. But what it sounds, what yours sounds like is a bit like an open mic night um, at uh, at the comedy club or something, you know, where people come and do a little 10 minute sk uh, sketch about something important. And I think that yeah. is extremely valuable. And I, I would actually like to see that sort of thing. We, we've we sort of done that as well um, with, with our own practice uh, in the curriculum mm -hmm. side. I, I don't get too involved with them, but mm -hmm. they've done that on the curriculum so you've got little, as you say, little snippets of good practice and, and also exercise, interestingly, and things like that. And, and you can look at them and, and um, pick up from them. And they're yeah. very handy. Um, I was going to say, um, going back right to the very beginning of your question about optimization and, 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 and technology, optimizing is, is a journey, not a destination. And then yeah. you actually know what the, the end should look like. I think we're just going to have to keep going. And that's, I think that's great. Um, but um, one example of that is the fact that um, uh, I would have spent, say, maybe a tenth to an eighth of my time in the car traveling places. Now I don't. Yes. And yeah. meetings happen on time. Yes. Astonishingly, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's funny. They do not happen before. No. They happen on the dot. People come well, in at one minute to ten there. now, don't they? Yeah. 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 Exactly. And they yeah. ha then happen. And this was what we used. The, the holy grail of meetings used to be: we would start on time, end on time, and there'd be an agenda. And now we're actually doing it. Yeah. We've also become almost paperless. Yes. I mean, we talked about the paperless office thirty years ago. There was actually a paper published, interestingly, almost fifty years ago. In fact, sixty years ago, with the paperless office Xerox. We are now almost there. Um, and it's because we've been forced to sit in the house and do yeah. things across by electronic communications. And I think it's, I, I'm hoping that the COVID will go away, but that we don't lose the learning from all of this and some of the great examples. And I was gonna say that um, perhaps, um, and, and this is kind of what I do in, in, in my daily work, perhaps um, Ramesh's system could actually handle the multiple inquiries that come about uh, uh, entries on Bob 
and that would be a good a good way of actually dealing with all of that. Um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we I I I actually published a paper with Linda and, and Kathy on that that community of practice. So I've just mm. I've just popped it in the chat there. Um, so if anybody's interested in reading that story, um, you can follow that link and it'll uh, it'll yes. take you to the PDF. By so, the way, Joe's actually going to look at Mike again. By the way. I know, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Not enough people know that. <laughs> I assume they meant you. It, 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 they didn't actually specify which one of us, but I assumed it was yourself. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm a bit shaggy with the COVID haircut at the moment. I? <laughs> <laughs> do what I do, just tie back. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you're back. Have we have we overrun? <laughs> no, we've, we've just reached the time. I do, I do, I'm aware that there are a couple of questions out there we, we're a little bit over time but it's the uh, uh it is the the last session so i think we can go a little bit over if you have time um we could maybe perhaps address some uh, uh, one or two questions um, there is uh there is one here that this people have voted on it's more of a statement i think than a question it's come from uh lynn wood it's we haven't mentioned mental health um yeah. technology can stress some people out that's all all she said but i think i get what she he's getting at would the panel like to perhaps just briefly where we don't have a lot of time perhaps uh, provide some thought on that i think mental health in the in the last six eight months has been really really important i mean the the, the week after covid started i i did a um a webinar um for a, a training company in dublin um and we've that was the first thing we we covered you know right you've got to look after yourself you've got to look after each other um, just, just do what you can for now. Uh, everybody's scared. Everybody's frightened. Um, so yeah, I would. Uh, we should have mentioned it before. Um, it's it's incredibly imp important at the moment. People are feeling very challenged, and and especially if the and I think it was it was Elaine H in the previous sessions chat. Um, she put something up about the digital divide and people being left behind with technology and stuff like that. And that must be incredibly difficult when you haven't got good broadband or you haven't got you know more than one laptop in the house and you need to do multiple zoom calls with your kids and with your partner and work and all the rest of it it, it for the people who have got technology it's very easy to forget about the people who haven't uh, and and that can you know contribute to, to mental health problems uh, when you're so dependent on tech um, i don't know ramesh what do I you think, think? yeah or, or yeah well, can I just very quickly come in? Yeah, I think I that um, right. we we the the first thing that that most a lot of people did as soon as they discovered Zoom was they had Zoom chats with their friends and loved ones, and then they started to have um, Zoom uh, um, evenings and competitions yes. and stuff. If we hadn't had that, we'd have been literally sitting in the house looking at each other and mm -hmm. hoping there was something good on TV. And uh, you know, I think that. The, Far from from impacting and, and making mental health worse, the ability to actually access live video chat, that ability to see people and be able to interact with them live and in real time, has actually uh, helped with those sorts of things tremendously. But I do agree, some people get stressed by using it. My own wife, who is in fact a counselor, um, had a lot of difficulty getting started. But once once she understood that, basically you're just talking to someone as if they're there across the, the table from you yeah. and just forget about the technology just as long as it works it's all great that's great but people that don't have it yes there is a big problem and you see all those people being handed out laptops to do schooling and all that kind of stuff and a lot of them have nothing at all or just a mobile phone and they're mm. all clustered around a mobile so yeah i understand that i agree with that yeah. i'm sitting festooned with stuff here but that's because most of it is is old or crap <laughs> yeah I think uh, in uh, just to add to what Brian said, I, mean, I see it in two, in two different uh, aspects. One is the actual impact it has created, not in the workplace. And when I say workplace, it's not necessarily my work. You know, if if you look at something like you know my daughter going to school, uh, their classes started on Zoom, and for the teachers, I mean it's e it's difficult keeping ten adults in a call. You can imagine keeping twenty two kids in a call. <laughs> I know I've got an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old in, in 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 the house. I mean, yeah, we, we spend three or four hours every mo every morning trying to wrangle them onto, you know, class dojo and the the, the homework and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, kudos to the teachers because the way they have evolved 
you know, in, in a span of few months, being able to handle a class on a Zoom call, yeah. keep the students in order, give them work, keep one from talking over the other. It's fascinating. So, you know, technology has been a great enabler, but I'm sure it added a lot of pressure in being able to do this new job. I mean, it's uh, for a teacher, it's teaching, <laughs> but the medium completely changed and it meant yeah. <laughs> different challenges. So I think that's, a, you know, that's a huge aspect, the way the same work being done by somebody changed in the model of delivery, in the model of handling, um, even objections. The second yeah. bit, which I think I personally miss in, you know, you know if you, you, as a young company and, you know, we do a lot of our work online. I mean, business meetings uh, where we have, you know, where we do even a requirement spec, we understand the requirements, we are able to take it and, you know, create something out of it. It's all online. But at the end of the day, you know, for example, a digital transformation, a panel like this, uh, you know, having an in life person experience where you're meeting people, talking, explaining, you know, having a coffee, I miss that. <laughs> sure, once it's back to yeah. normal. I think we all miss yeah. that. We all miss going to the pub, like like, like the, the guy previously <laughs> said, don't we? But but I tell you what, we would never have met today Yeah, agreed. without without this <laughs> and without Chris having put this together and stuff. So, I mean, there's, there's pluses and minuses here, aren't there? Exactly. It's going to be a hybrid. According <laughs> to me, it's going to be a hybrid. Both will yeah. coexist. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, um, Nick, do you want to do you want to finish off for us? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I could, I could only, only concur with everybody. It's, 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 it's so important to remember the people that don't have, yeah, don't have the connections and don't have the laptops and don't, have, you know, and and people that haven't used phones for such purposes and only really ever really used them to call people. Uh, it's, it's easy to get lost in how engaged we can be and and forget such things. And it's, uh, it's so important that people are supported and that network of of being human is kept going. Um, so it's important to support our, support our nans and support everybody um, going forward. And I know that there's, there's, we do a lot of work with um, Oxford Mental Health Trust um, through Bob, and the work that they're doing is phenomenal in, in just doing using digital services to keep patients um, keep, keep keep patients happy and feeling secure, and in, encouraging that well being is basically kept as a as a core factor. And I think that there's a lot to learn from that going forward, and in, in that that, that well being is is just something we need to consider a lot more in, in the world cool it's fantastic Great. yeah thank you thank you so much everybody i think we might have to um wind up there call it a call it a day unfortunately it's um it's been a, a long day but i've enjoyed um every session and and particularly this one as well um some some great discussion going on and i, and I appreciate all your input um uh, but i'll leave it at that and i'll let you guys all go now um joe i really uh, appreciate um you taking on the moderator role and, and a wonderful job you did i think uh, people in the in the audience will agree your questions are, are brilliant um <laughs> well it was easy it was easy with this panel i mean it was a fantastic panel so uh, really yeah. varied and interesting people so i mean wonderful yeah i, I had the easy job yeah <laughs> 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 well well thanks to all of you um I, I appreciate it i'll let you go now um and i'll say uh, my final words for the day but thanks again everybody and all the best thanks a lot goodbye bye, bye. bye.